welcome. Thank you so much, Jeff. That was great. Um, welcome to our first Better Beans here in Bloomington. This is first event, one of three. Uh, before I introduce Dr. Stacy Zuber, um, I wanted to say this thank you so much for attending. Um, I tend to have the reputation of having major weather events when I have <laughs> field days as well as others. So we, we're a little skeptical about the snow, but that's what you do in January, right? Um, so my name is Stephanie Porter, and I'm the ISA Outreach Agronomist, uh, as well as CCA. And normally we would have Abigail Peterson, who is our uh, agronomy director, come up and give a team update. She unfortunately was not able to be here. She's at a leadership conference, um, learning more how to lead us uh, uh, here at ISA. But I also want to have and recognize other members. If you are a, uh, other members, other people that work at ISA, if you work at Illinois Soybean Association, stand up. Nobody's standing. <laughs> and then I also want to point out uh, members of our team. And so we also have Kelsey Litchfield uh, that is running the YouTube show here in the front. Welcome those that are online. And then we also have Deanna Burkhart there in the back. So um, we do have a table outside to learn more about our agronomy team. So if you haven't visited it, uh, make sure you do pick up some things and learn more about you know, our checkoff funded research, um, our new on-farm trialing, uh, which you'll also learn a lot more about that at the summit, um, upcoming summit on February 1st, and as well as Elsoy Advisor. So um, next up, as a CCA or a certified crop advisor, I want to make sure that you know we don't have the scan uh, on the PowerPoint. It will be outside on the sign-up sheet. So if you are a CCA and you need to get your CUs, make sure you go out to the table and either sign or scan um, to get your CUs for today's session, which include both pest management and nutrient management. Um, and as always, we appreciate um, the opportunity to partner with the Certified Crop Advisor Program. Today, we have a total of three presentations, as well as a coffee break at 10.15. And we will also have lunch available at the conclusion. Um, but if you need anything, make sure that you contact one of uh, the ISA uh, staff members, or we have the Rooted In uh, t-shirts on. So with that, I want to introduce our first presenter this morning, uh, Dr. Stacy Zuber. She is a research data scientist for the Illinois Soybean Association. Dr. Zuber earned a Master's of Science as well as a PhD in Crop Sciences from U of I, um, Urbana-Champaign. Uh, she gained research experience as a postdoc researcher at Purdue University and at the University of Missouri-Columbia, particularly working with analysis of on-farm research data. She works on behalf of Illinois Soybean Farmers in the development and implementation of agricultural research and outreach programs. Her emphasis is on designing and implementing on-farm research trials, analyzing data and preparing and delivering outreach materials to share findings with the agricultural community. Please join me in welcoming Stacy. Good morning, everyone. So today, I'm going to be doing a talk about making sense of soil health. Uh, so I don't think it was in my introduction, but uh, Jeff did mention I used to work uh, previously before working with ISA. I was the soil health specialist for the state of Illinois with the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. So I have a lot of experience with soil health and talking um, about a lot of the pieces of that. And today, I just want to go through some of the details of that and how you could use that on your farm. How can you evaluate soil health on your farm and what are, your, what are you looking for? So every time I talk about soil health, I always want to start with 
just the baseline of what are we talking about? What does soil health mean? What is it? And so I'm starting with the NRCS definition of soil health. It's the continued capacity of a soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. So it's really bringing in a lot of pieces. It's a complicated definition, uh, maybe, because there's a lot of pieces that go into that. But I like to focus on a few parts of this to really drive it home and how this, what this actually means with the soil on your field, on your farm. So the first thing I want to highlight in this definition is the word function. To me, this is the key piece of what we're talking about with soil health. It is functions. How does your soil function? And as a farmer, how does it function for you? How can you make it work better for you? So there's a lot of kind of different functions we're looking at when we're talking about soil health. The first one is just producing our food, fuel, fiber, biofuels, medicine, all of those pieces. How is it yielding? That's the, the first and foremost, right? And that's probably the easiest one to think about. Is it helping us grow our crops? But within that, we have a lot of these other functions that can kind of build into this to help with that yielding, help with that production. And we have, uh, you know, water dynamics moving through the, the soil. How does that water get into your fields, into your soil? Is it holding on to that water very well? Is it allowing your crops to access that water? Or are you having problems with it getting into your fields and it's running off the surface and it's taking your soil organic matter with it, it's taking your phosphorus, um, maybe you have too much nitrate leaching out. We need to think about how those, that water interacts with the soil. And we wanna make sure that it's working for us, not against us. We have that cycling of nutrients. So I'll talk a lot about this today, but a lot of nutrients are coming from the soil that our crops use. Obviously we're, you know, relying on fertilizer and inputs as well, but that soil can provide somewhere around 50% of the, the nutrient needs for many of our crops most of the time. We can get quite a bit from our soil, so we wanna make sure that cycling process is working and it's giving it to our crops when our crops need it as much as possible, and we're not losing it when we don't have crops out there. You know, things like cover crop can scavenge some of those nutrients and keep them on your fields, so they're not leaving over the fall and winter when we don't have our cash crops out there growing. Um, just general resilience, we want to be able to hold up, make our crops more um, resilient in the face of any kind of weather extreme, whether that's drought, which we've kind of dealt with, um, flooding and um, excess precipitation, uh, temperature extremes, all of those, we've dealt with them before, we'll deal with them again, but we want to make sure that our soils are helping us deal with those issues because we really can't, one of the biggest things we can't control in farming is Mother Nature. We can't do anything about that other than to make sure that our soils are as resilient as possible and help us as much as they can. So then we have, you know, protection from pathogens and stress. You know, that kind of comes in. Stress can be that weather-related issue, but also pathogens. How can our soils help us against disease, pressure, and pests? Um, that one's probably not one we think about as much. I'm gonna have a slide in here to talk about this a little bit. It's one of my favorite things. Um, to look at, and I really hope going forward in the future that's something we can do more research on and evaluate because I think that's a really um, promising piece of the puzzle with soil health. Um, then we have storing carbon, moderating the gas of, or release of gases. So, you know, carbon sequestration, carbon markets, uh, those are some big buzzwords out there right now. How can farmers, you know, get those incentives? But Regardless of whether that's why you're doing this, carbon in your soils, that's organic matter. We all would like to have more organic matter in our soils because they can be very helpful for a lot of these other functions. And we're gonna go through some of that today as well. And then resisting erosive forces. I mean, erosion is bad. We never wanna to have to deal with that. 
it steals from your farms, from your fields, from your soils. It's taking organic matter with it. It's taking phosphorus with it. That's money that you are losing. Right? So if we can get our soils healthier, that means that we're getting it to function better. You know, think of it as a human health kind of thing. For you, when you're healthy, the healthier you are, the more you can do. Right? So the same thing with our soils. The healthier our soils are, the more they can do, and the more they can do for us. So coming back to this definition one more time, that vital living ecosystem. That's the other part of this definition that I always like to highlight. And that's because it's the living organisms in our soil that are doing those functions. We may not see them, some of them we do, you know, earthworms, beetles. We can see them, but there's plenty in there that we can't, that are invisible to the naked eye. But they are doing so much for us. We look at this, this is a uh, USB snare um, graphic, but I really think it does a really good job of highlighting all of the functions and benefits that those microbes are giving to us. And if you look at this, almost every single one of these matches up with those functions that I just had on the, the slide before, right? So it's the microbes, it's those organisms within the soil that are driving those functions, that are driving soil health. So we're not taking, taking care of the microbes within the soil. We are not really getting the full benefits, the full functions of the soil either. So this is just another graphic I like to look at that kind of shows the diversity of the different types of organisms we're talking about. You know, things like mycorrhizal fungi, um, tardigrade, if you want to go to that, there's nematodes, I know nematodes, not always the best for us, but the vast majority of them are very beneficial for us in relating to nutrient cycling and release of nutrients. You know, there's springtails, earthworms, holy polies, you go through the list. There's all sorts of different organisms ones you can see and ones that you can't that are in there that are driving these soil functions and driving soil health. So when we're talking about how do we help those microbes, how do we help those organisms live, grow, and do those functions for us, it all comes back to these four soil health principles. These are the four soil health principles from NRCS. And we have the ones, um, on the right, but I'm going to start with first, minimizing disturbance and maximizing soil cover. <laughs> so those two particular soil principles, soil health principles, are all about how do we protect what we already have in our soils, the soil aggregates, the soil organic matter, how do we protect that? We want to keep it there. So this, in a lot of ways, is about preventing erosion, preventing the loss of what we already have there, but we tie that into the other two stuff, um, other two principles on here, feeding and fueling biology, that's maximizing the nearest living roots, that's maximizing biodiversity, that's what we're feeding that biology. And as we feed the biology, those organisms within the soil, they can then develop more aggregates, add more organic matter to our soils. So it's kind of back and forth between these two sides. But if you only have one of these sides, if you only are doing the protect side, if you're only doing, say for instance, no till on its own, that is minimizing disturbance. That's maximizing soil cover. And so that protects what we have there, but it takes a long time to build up from there. There's a long transition period sometimes if you go from conventional to, to no till. And that's because you're not really hitting that other side the feeding and fueling the biology quite as much. Yes, there's more residues there that aren't breaking down as quickly, but we're not really adding continuous growth roots. We're not really adding biodiversity. So that's where something like cover crops, even if it's just a winter killed cover crop, can really help add to that. It can help feed the biology. And again, it's the biology that's doing all the work. It's all these different critters in our soils that are you know, cycling the nutrient they're helping build those aggregates that help the water infiltration, water retention. They're the ones that are helping that soil resist erosion. 
Because that's the other piece of this. It's not just we need to provide cover over the surface. We also need to build a soil structure that even if you get a heavy rainfall event, isn't going to wash away because those aggregates are glued together, are staying in place longer. And I'll get into more of that as we go along. But these organisms within the soil, they're really concentrated in hot spots within our soil. You know, if you dig up a, a, a shovel full of soil in one place in your field and go even just a couple inches away and take another shovel full, you might have very different numbers of organisms, just depending on what the environment is like where you're digging. So the closer you are to roots, you're gonna have a lot more organisms. That's the rhizosphere. That's where microbes are getting fed directly from the plant roots and from exudates that are things like sugars and proteins. You know, in earthworm channels and root channels, those are great places for the, the roots to go back and grow into because it's got higher amounts of organic matter in those areas. But that's also where all our microbes are living because they want that organic matter too. Um, we have the surface layer on our, with the litter on the aggregates themselves and pore spaces. I don't want to get too much into the weeds kind of on this part of it with these different hot spots, but it's just important to know that there are places in your soils that have a lot of these microbes and places that don't have as many. That doesn't mean that your soil that doesn't have very many isn't functioning. It may not need them as much. You need uh, it, you know, they're still doing the work over, even if there's kind of one spot that's more of a desert where there's not as much there, we're still getting these functions that are happening. But what this means for us when we're trying to, to monitor soil health and test it, <laughs> as I get into this, we're gonna be talking about some of the different soil health tests that are out there that can have really big impacts on your results that you're getting as you try to quantify soil health in your fields, right? Um, the other thing we need to remember is these are living organisms. Just like us, they like certain conditions and they don't like others. I don't know how many of you are looking forward to this weekend, but I am not looking forward to possible negative 10 degrees. That's not an environment I enjoy, right? My girls are the same way. They have high temperatures that they don't like and low temperatures that they don't like. They go dormant. They're not doing anything during those times when it's the conditions they don't like. They don't like too dry. Most of them can't, well, not most. Aerobic ones are not going to be very happy in saturated soils. They don't have oxygen. They need it. So they go dormant as well. So those are also impacts that we have when we're trying to measure these, when we're trying to evaluate these. So within our soils, we have you know a lot of spatial variability. I've already mentioned this. Our soil indicators, you know, just like those functions are related to the organisms, it makes sense that what we're testing for when we're testing these soils for soil health, they're going to be related to this as well. So that means when we're testing these soils, when we're trying to quantify soil health out there in the field, there's some variability. We have to consider that when we're taking these tests. If we're using indicators to try to test our soil health, it's not going to be the same every single spot in your field. So you have to be careful where you sample and make sure that you're trying to match up those conditions as much as possible if you're going back when you're doing comparisons. That means these are also kind of difficult to measure the soil health functions directly because they're so closely tied to these organisms. And we are using tests that are proxies. We can't directly, we, there's a few tests that you can do out in the field, right? But they're really difficult to quantify. Most of our tests for soil health are really proxies, representations of what's happening out in the field that we have to take when we take that soil sample and take it back to the lab. I mean, it's the same thing with soil fertility tests. You know, when you get your results back at a soil fertility test, it's what that test says is available. It's been calibrated to what's actually available and how the plants react to it. You know, how much is available to them. But it's not saying, well, there's exactly this many grams of nitrogen available. It's representing how much is out there. So we can use that. It's the same thing with these. When I say this is exactly how much aggregates you have out there, this is representing. And so if we can make comparisons, it gives us a good idea of how our soil health has improved or how it is in comparison to other management. So going through some of these different functions that I've already kind of mentioned a little bit, 
but how do we test for those? How do we look at these? What are we looking for? So to start out, so the organic matter. This is probably the one of these that everyone is the most familiar with, right? We, it's also talked a lot about as the key indicator for soil health. And that's because it's so closely related to almost every, well actually, pretty much all of those functions that I've already talked about. It has impact on how your soil is able to resist erosion. That's the structural stability of the soils. It helps us with retaining water, right? Holding on, water holding capacity is really dependent on organic matter. It plays a little bit, but a lot of that is organic matter. That's an increased effect. A lot of our nutrients are cycling through the organic matter. That's how it's happening. It's coming from those that organic matter, but we also want to build up the organic matter. That can help with resilience. That can help with that cation exchange capacity. So many different pieces of what we're looking for in our soil are related to soil organic matter. And this is one of the three um, soil health indicators. The Soil Health Institute, they did, you know, all across the United States and even Canada and Mexico, they did all of North America. They looked at all of these different research locations and studied a lot of different soil health indicators. And they came up with three ones that they are like, these are the ones that work everywhere. They gave you information. This is what you should always go to, at the very least. And soil organic matter is one of them. Now, there is a downside of using soil organic matter to evaluate soil health. And that's because it doesn't change that quickly. It can take a good amount of time. I have you know, three to five years. If you are starting in soils that are in here, higher inherent organic matter or prairie soil, soils or dark black soils, it may take, take longer than that. It's a slow process with organic matter, right? So when we're trying to evaluate soil health, that's not always our friend. We want to see those changes a little faster. We want measurements that are a little more sensitive to that. So that's, if we look at the big picture of how carbon is cycled through our soils, what's actually happening as we are adding carbon to our soils, as we are building soil organic matter, I, I kind of really like this um, image. I think it did, does a good job of showing how much of this process is through the microbes, right? So we are getting carbon that comes in. It's coming in from our plants. You know, the leaves, the roots, root exudates, those sugars and proteins, things that the roots release themselves. Those are coming in and they're getting eaten, decomposed, broken down by the microbes. It's all cycling through the microbes in here. So some of them are more complex, that takes more steps, the slower process. Some of them are very simple, just basic sugars, basic amino acids that get eaten. But they cycle through the microbes and then they end up, some of that influx, that efflux of carbon dioxide, they breathe out carbon dioxide just like us. So some of it does get lost in the atmosphere, but the rest of it, that is part of that stable organic matter pool that we have. And that, a lot of times that's what we think of when we're thinking of organic matter. It's all of it, really. But when we think about organic matter, we tend to focus on that stable carbon pool, right? And so that is, this part is already broken down further. And if we get into this, these more break down into even more different types of pools within our cellular organic matter. So we have all of these different ones. I'm going to start with the part that I think this is what we tend to think about when we think about cellular organic matter, the humus. This is a long turnover. It's pretty stable. It stays in your soil for a really long time. It's the part of your, your soil organic matter that's giving it that dark color. It's protected within your soils. And the way that it's protected, now that, I don't want to dive too much into the background of this, used to be really considered primarily chemically protected. It just 
These are so complex molecules that they couldn't be broken down any further. That's why they're still there. And that's, that's part of it. There's a little bit of that. But the vast majority of why this is stable in our soils is because it's protected on those clay surfaces, in soil aggregates, in those ultra microspores. It has to do with the aggregates. That's why it's protected. It's because primarily that's the organic matter that's been incorporated into those aggregates. It's actually acting as the glue to hold those aggregates together. So if we look at this, these are some diagrams <laughs> showing how those aggregates are held together. We have in our soils sand, silt, and clay particles. Those are glue. If you just have those by themselves, the clays will stick together because they, they like to stick together. So a little bit. But primarily, it's that glue of the organic matter that's holding those aggregates together, that's keeping them in place, and that leaves open pore spaces between them. Right? And so there's some diagrams there on the, the bottom left where we have these different proteins that are actually chemically acting as glues, holding different particles together. You get some physical structures from different types of organisms like the bacilla of um, some fungi. We have bacteria filaments. We have all these things holding those different aggregates together. But it's coming from those microbes. It's coming from even plant roots. It's coming from organisms in the soil. They are what are holding those sand, silt, and clay particles together. And what this means for us in our soils is, think about this, we need organic matter to hold those aggregates together, right? It's the organic matter that's gluing them. But the more of that we have, the more those soils hold together, those particles are glued together, the less we lose when we have water, when we have rain, heavy rainfall. Because if you look at that picture, here. So this right here, if we look at this, when we have those aggregates, that leaves open pore spaces between them. Those individual particles have been glued together, it leaves those open pore spaces, it improves water infiltration because now that water can get in. It also helps reduce runoff and erosion because if you look at that image on the right up there, this guy, this is what happens when our particles are not glued well together. When that raindrop hits that surface of the soil, especially if you want soil cover, when it hits that, it hits with a certain amount of force. It may not feel like much to us, but to those individual tiny particles of soil, that's a lot of force. Every raindrop that hits it. If those particles, the sand, silt, and clay, they're not glued together very well, they break loose. And where do they go? They go to the slope, oh, they're off that slope. They're going into your ditches. And they're taking with it any organic matter that was dislodged, phosphorus that's chemically attached, those are gone. Right? That's erosion. I mean, best case scenario, it sits in your field. But now you have standing water, which is its own kind of problem. And then if it's sitting there, those particles start settling out, they fill in any old pore spaces that you had. So that makes the problem worse and just continues to make it worse. Right? So this is why, you know, we have those organisms and we're feeding the biology within our soils. They helped to create these glues and hold the particles together, which helps you know, protect our soils. So that's why I'm saying we have both sides of those principles. We want to protect what we have, but we need the biology to help us build it to be better. And all of this comes back if you think about how do we get out to the field? You know, what does this really mean for me as a farmer? Well, if you can get out to the field a little earlier because your soils are allowing the water to go in, they're not running off the surface and taking nutrients with it. They're not ponding 
on your field. I don't know about you, but if you can get out in the field sometimes just a couple hours, a couple a day earlier, that's a big deal. Especially if you have wet springs, or if you it's wet and you need to harvest. So it can really help protect those soils because you're not having as much spring water gives us those benefits. So when we're looking at these in the field, um, you know, there's, there's a couple different things I'll get to eventually on this, but we can look at, you know, if you have standing water, but if we want to quantify this, there are lab tests, there's the soil water stable aggregates that we can use, um, which basically is just the percentage of aggregates that are gonna hold together and stay stable. Um, there are some differences in different labs on how, what methods they use. So make sure if you are doing this, you know, don't try to compare two different labs, use the same one. Um, this is, along with organic matter, this is another of the three highly recommended measurements from the Soil Health Institute. Institute. Um, this is definitely one that I would do every time if I could, uh, if you're evaluating soil health. All right, back to that same pools of soil organic matter. I like to read these slides because I like to go back and make sure we're seeing how these all fit together. This time, we're gonna talk about this side, the left. Our labile soil organic matter. This is the part that's rapid turnover. This is also the food for our lot of our microbes. You know, once it's protected, it's in this sort of aggregate, they can't get to it anymore. The labile part, the part that's turning over, that's their food, that's the microbes are eating. What that also means is that it is more sensitive to changes in management. It responds more rapidly, and we can test that. So we are looking, or we can look at this, these rapid turnover carbon, so they're getting better, as what we will see happen down the road in that protected, in that humus portion of the soil organic matter because it's coming from this rapid turnover part first. So we can see these changes, you know, in one to three years if we change management and then see that rather than waiting that three to five or in many soil seven, ten years on that soil organic matter. So there are two tests um, out there right now that you can use that commercial labs have uh, to test this rapid turnover carbon. Um, there's active carbon, sometimes also called permanganate oxidizable carbon. It's like basically they use a chemical reaction and they're testing um, how much is oxidized, how much reacts in your soil uh, to tell us how much of this active, active carbon you have. Um, and there's a lot of research out there that show, has shown that it is a useful indicator for that long-term carbon sequestration. So we're testing what's happening in that rapid turnover, but it's correlating, it's matching up with what we see happen down the road in that long-term organic matter, the, the stable organic matter pool. There's also the water extractable organic carbon as a part of the Haney test um, that gets you know, used in the Haney's soil health calculation, if you're familiar with that. But that just uses, there's no reaction, they just, extract it with water and test how much dissolves in water. Um, so it's a little straightforward. And so the rationale with that one, um, not, not needing a chemical reaction, just using the water, is that that's gonna be the carbon that's most readily available to microbes within the soil because the water, that's the solvent in the soil as well as what they're using. Um, it kind of ignores a few other possible enzymes and chemical reactions and things that are happening, but it gets us there. It gets us a pretty good idea. All right, so moving on from carbon and organic matter to the nutrients that are in organic matter, other nutrients. So just starting with nitrogen. You know, when we think about the nitrogen cycle, I mean, we have this with almost all of our nutrient cycles, but the microbes are really driving the vast majority of those processes that are happening within our soils that are releasing those nutrients that are making the plants available, right? Our plants can't take up 
the nitrogen that's stored in organic forms. They need the inorganic forms, and that relies on microbes to do those processes. Right, so we need them, we need a diverse mix of microbes within our soil that are able to do these different processes. So we can test, you know, within soil the that same rapid turnover pool of organic matter, just the nitrogen that's in that. Right? So that previously with this I was talking about the carbon that's in that rapid turnover pool. But now there's nitrogen in there as well. So we're looking at that. This is again the easily food for the microbes. And we want to know how much nitrogen might be released from that. Um, so a couple different ones, um, tools or tests that are out there. We have the ACE soil protein. So ACE stands for autoclave citrate extractable. I'm going with ACE, it's much easier to say. Um, but this is basically most of the soil organic matter that our microbes are going to eat is in those soils as proteins. So we can test how much of those proteins are in there. There's also, just like there was with the carbon, a lot of extractable organic nitrogen one. Um, again, that is part of the Haney test. These are just trying to get at how much nitrogen is easy for those microbes to access that they can use as fuel. They, they can eat and then that gives us an indication. It's not a direct correlation. There's other tests that can tell you a little more about how much, how much nitrogen might be released. But this is really getting at how well is that nitrogen able to cycle within the soil. Now this one, this is also a Haney test. Um, this is the H3A extract. So if you do a Haney test, this is typically a part of that to do the nutrient side of it. I know there's a lot of interest in this, um, but this is a, another one that really tries to get a little more directly at that question as to what are the microbes able to deliver to me as far as nutrients that traditional fertility tests might not be able to tell me. Um, even to the point, this is just some, an example, one that I, I pulled some screenshots from, where they're telling you, this is how much is available, and if you look at this versus just the traditional evaluation, the traditional fertility test, this is the difference. Um, there's a lot of people really interested in this. There's maybe needs to be a little more calibration on this um, to really rely on it. But it's an interesting thing to think about because it really looks at, it's trying to look at, okay, we can measure how much nitrogen is in here, but I really want to know how much can be released. And that's the key of this. It's really getting to that component of what are the microbes able to release. I think this still needs work before it's like widely adopted, but it's an interesting purpose. I like it, I want to see where it goes. Another way we can look at these nutrient cycles and how we can measure them is to do with enzyme activities. So microbes use, different microbes use different enzymes depending on what part of these cycles they're involved in. But enzymes are basically, they're proteins, but they're metabolic proteins. What that means is they are using them to break down these molecules to eat their food they're basically, you can think of them as keys going into a lock. There are certain enzymes that fit with certain proteins that help break those molecules open and allow the microbes to eat that compound, to break it down, to use some of the energy, but in some cases, just break them into smaller pieces. So for instance, like cellulose, they can break, there's enzymes that break cellulose into smaller pieces that fit on you know, other smaller sugar molecule but then other microbes can come in and eat that don't need these complex enzymes to get to. So there's all of these different types of complex compounds within our soils. We have cellulose, DNA, different lipids, chitin, lignin, all of those. And there are certain enzymes that work for each of these different types of compounds. So we can look here, you know, beyond just the nitrogen cycle, the carbon cycle, we also have the sulfur cycle, phosphorus, there's a lot of different enzymes involved. These right here that I have stars by, these are probably um, 
as far as looking at these and quantifying these, these are the ones that are the most widely used. Primarily because most of these can be done on air-dried soils. The rest of them, these enzymes break down very quickly in the soil. So if you take a sample from your field, you have to be very careful in how you store it, keep it refrigerated and all these things to be able to then take it back to a lab and test it. Um, the ones that have started by, for the most part, they give you reliable results even on air-dried soils. So these, all these enzymes are telling us what the potential within those soils to be able to break down these different molecules to release these nutrients. And that can give us a good idea. You know, how much might we have to use in the future here? Is that directly measuring how much microbes you have to do those processes? But one of the components in doing that process, in breaking those apart, we can measure that. We can measure how much might be coming out. So that's one of the ways we can do that. All right, then last time, I swear, <laughs> back on the, the same pools of soil organic matter. So we've looked kind of at all of these so far, but I really want to dial in on this biomass, the living organisms, right? They're the ones that are doing all this work. They are still considered, even though they're living, they're part of that organic matter as well. A lot of times we don't think of them as part of the organic matter, but they are. They're part of that. And we want to see what's happening there, too. They're the ones doing the work. Um, PLSAs, you've heard of that, phospholipid fatty acids. Um, they are probably the easiest way for us to see what's there in those. We can get, you can do genetic testing, DNA, RNA testing to get very specific on different species and things like that. But that gets expensive, um, and it's mostly at a research level at this time. Um, and even on that, we don't exactly know what you need and what you don't need, because it's very dependent on your soils. But with phospholipid fatty acids, we can get a you know big picture idea. What do we have there? How many bacteria do we have? How many fungi do we have? Do we have mycorrhizal fungi? We can get those kind of big picture microbial groups. And the way this works is basically looking at what are the fatty acids that are in the cell membrane. Every cell, your cell, microbe cells, or from cells, all of the cells have this cell membrane that is made up of phospholipid fatty acids. They're in your way back into high school biology maybe, but there's that phospholipid fatty acid bilayer um, that's on the surface of those cells. It's the barrier, the membrane. And there are certain fatty acids that are only found in certain types of organisms, in certain, certain types of cells. So there's certain fatty acids that you would only find in a bacterial cell. There are certain ones that you'd only find in a fungi cell. And so we can use that to tell us how many, if we can detect that those are there, that can tell us how many bacteria are there, how many fungi are there, at least on a relative sense. It's not giving us specific numbers, but it's giving us an idea of those ratios and those comparisons. So that can be really helpful. It can also tell us um, some different types of fatty acids, different types of ratios of these different organisms. It can tell us about how well that soil is able to deal with stress. It can tell us a lot about microbial community structure. I will say that I've worked with these a lot, and even for me, <laughs> the data that you get back is still very confusing, difficult to interpret. Um, and then this is the third and final of the soil health recommended measurements. It is, you know, looking at microbial activities, soil respiration, or also sometimes called short-term carbon mineralization. So basically you take the, well, the soil, add water to it, it gets incubated for a certain number of hours. As the water gets added, it waves those microbes back up, they were dormant. So now they're going back to work. Whatever job, whatever function, whatever cycling they do within that soil, they're doing it, but in a lab setting. 
And so just like us, when we work, we breathe out carbon dioxide. When those microbes work, they breathe out carbon dioxide. So we go for a certain amount of time and see how much carbon dioxide gets released. That tells us how much activity we have within the soil. Right? So generally, most um, commercial labs are doing this for 24 hours. There is, um, you know, some that will do it a little longer, up to 96 hours. Um, my experience with the data is the longer term is a little more consistent. Gives you a fuller picture of all of what's happening and not just like the immediate flush of carbon dioxide that gets released when that water gets added. But they're both very, they both can be useful to tell us about that microbial activity. So I wanted to make sure on those, all of those tests are tied to the different soil functions. But we have to go back to that idea of variability. There's a lot of spatial variability in our soils. So if we're testing for soil health, we have to remember that, that those functions are a product of the microbes. And the microbes are here and there, but not here. You know, they're spaced out within our field because they're concentrated in those hot spots. So what that means, even more than what you would do with any kind of traditional soil health or soil testing that you've done, you have to make sure to be consistent with soil health testing. The phase of the rotation makes a big difference. The time of the year. And I kind of have these in the order of the easiest for you to control. You can control what year you in your what phase of your rotation are you doing it in the soybean? Are you doing it in the corn? You can control the time of the year. Your proximity to roots. This may not be one that you think about, but remember, those microbes, they like near the roots. They're not gonna be further away from the roots. So if you go out and try to take samples in two different fields, and in one field you're sticking real close to those roots every time, the other field you're you know 15 inches away in the middle of the row, in a 30 inch row, you're gonna get that 30 inch row one in the middle, you're not gonna get very high numbers. But it's because you were further away from the roots. The closer you are to the roots, the more microbes you have. Right? That means these tests are gonna be higher numbers as well, because that's what they're looking for is the products, the activities of those microbes. And then the soil temp and moisture. Uh, this is one that really makes a big difference, but it's hard to control because we're dependent on this, the mother nature. Because I can go back and control, I'm going to go sample here in a cornfield in June. I'm going to sample then. Well, if I wait, you know, let's say four years, so I'm going to get back in that same phase of rotation. I want to make sure I, I, I can see some difference. I'm going to go back four years later, same time of year. I'm going to control all those other pieces. Well, I can't control the weather. Maybe it's a hotter year, a drier year. I'm going to get very different results. And I mean, exact time of the year is not maybe a big difference, but you can't control Mother Nature. You can't always predict it, so you have to do the best you can. But as long as you remember, you pay attention, you record what those temperatures and moistures were, that can help you when you go back to interpret those results to say, all right, that was a wetter year when I sampled. This is a drier year. Of course, my numbers are going to be slightly lower this year than they were that first time. It's not that my soil health went down. It's that it was drier, more microbes were dormant or died off, and so I'm not seeing as much activity. That's what makes this complicated, but you got to remember those pieces. Another piece of this, you may have noticed, I didn't give you numbers on any of those tests. And that's because we just don't have good thresholds. We don't have good numbers for most of these. So we need a comparison. We have something to compare it to. You know, for a fertility test, you have a number that you're comparing it against. We don't have that with these soil health tests. Partially that's because they can be so much different from you know, soil to soil, their potential can be so different. That also makes this very complicated. Another piece of this, just make sure to follow the lab instructions. You know, how do you sample? How do you ship these soils? 
And then we've got to remember that these tests are pricey. Most of the time, you need to get individual tests of some of these for, you know, $20 a sample. If you do a package, which is what most of these come in, you're talking minimum 50 most of the time per sample. And we just, there's so much variability of the across the field. You might think, well, we should do more. We should do more sampling. But they're expensive, and that just gives you more information that's difficult to interpret. So in these cases, most of the time, you know, we come to the, the recommendation of what I think you should do, what my recommendation always is, some sort of sample sampling. You don't need to do a lot of samples in a field, but you need to be able to have something to compare it against. So maybe that means you have a field that you just got, you're renting, and it's been sold like crazy, and you want to monitor it over time because you're going to implement no-till or cover crops, and you're going to see how it's changing. You can go back to that spot every couple of years, sample it again. You know, making sure you're in the same room, great phase of rotation at the same time here, track it that way. It may also just mean I have two fields, very different management that I've done, and I want to compare what the soil health is in this field that's done cover crops and no-till to this one where I'm doing conventional tillage. Has that cover crops and no-till made a difference? Well, if you're going to do that, match up your conditions as much as you can. Right? Try to get the same, um, you know, even landscape position. Is it on the top of the hill? Is it at the bottom? What's your soil types? It may be even easier just try to match up, you know, your yield maps and pick you know, highest yielding spots. You can do that. That kind of thing. Um, I did want to kind of put a plug. These are two extension publications when I was doing my postdocs. So I have one for Purdue when I was over in Indiana and one in Missouri. I know they say the word says Missouri, but it's still very helpful in Illinois as far as I can those, those are out there. Um, I have links on there, but you can kind of just Google those names, how to understand and interpret soil health test at Purdue and getting started with soil health testing in Missouri. Those kind of go through a lot of the pieces even more in depth than what I've talked today. So we've covered a lot, a lot of the different soil functions, but there are a few others that maybe we haven't talked about that we still might want to assess. So there are in-field assessments. This is a much cheaper option, but this can be very helpful as well. You know, I, I mentioned before their aggregates. You know, we don't want standing water, we don't want, want ponding. So if you have an area in your field that, you know, <laughs> has had those issues in the past and you're implementing cover crops, implementing no till, track that over time. Does that get smaller? Is it is it staying the same? Are we making progress there? Look for earthworms and biopores, those earthworm channels I talked about that the roots go back to, track those. You know, go back and look, are we seeing those? Are they um, and we see earthworm activity, we want to track the residues on our surface. Are they breaking down the way they should? You know, even in a no-till system, as we build that biology, as we, as we feed and fuel the biology in those, I know sometimes people are worried they have to till to break down those residues. But if we have the biology, if we're feeding it, eventually you should get to a point where those microbes are breaking those residues down if we have the earthworms that can kind of incorporate those residue into the soil from the surface, you don't have to rely on tillage to break it down if you have the microbes in there. It's not an overnight thing. It takes time to get there, but you will see it. We want to minimize that surface crusting as well, so that comes back to having good aggregates and having soil cover so the raindrops aren't breaking those particles apart. And then, one of my favorite ones to do that's pretty easy is these slake tests or, or slump tests. If you've seen those, um, you know, this one is just the, the slake test where you're putting in, you know, a mason jar and some kind of wire that you can use as a basket to put that clump of soil in. A slump test is very similar. It's just using, you know, like a sink, a wire sink strainer, something like that. You crumble the soil in into the water and then, um, or into the sink strainer submerge it in water for just a minute, it just has to get wet, and then you take it and flip it over and you see how well that soil stays together, where it kind of turns into mud. If it breaks apart really easily, 
then that's an indication of, of poor aggregation. And that then you can think about it, what's happening in these soils and when they get in the water, this is what's happening in your field as well. You know, in this particular demonstration here, that soil that's on the right, that's the no-till and the tilled one, that's breaking apart very easily. If you think about it, when you have rainfall, those soils will break apart, those particles will break apart, and where are they going? So you can look at that in your fields. Some of these things, functions we talk about are trickier to measure. You know, pathogens, I talked about this, you know, the, the idea of uh, plant protection of pathogens. Um, this is one that, there's some studies out there showing this, a lot of them are greenhouse, it's not as much in the field, but there's a good indication that we do have this. This is a, a study where they show, you know, the repeat exposure to a pathogen that when the plant initially got exposed to the pathogen, it was susceptible, it, you know, had disease severity there, but it was able to signal to the microbes within the soil, hey, I'm being attacked, can you help? And the microbes responded. The microbial community changed as a response to that signal, became more diverse, and then when the pathogen was reintroduced, much lower disease severity. Now, if you think about this in our fields, a lot of that disease suppression from a microbial community comes from having a diverse microbial community. If we have a microbial community structure that looks more like this, we have all sorts of different types of microbes. If you compare that to this guy, this low diversity, in that case, the pathogens, they get to be a larger component of that microbial community. If we have a more diverse community like this, there's such a small slice of that pie. So they can be suppressed. There's competition from the other microbes. They don't get quite as much of a foothold. And so they can be, you know, controlled a little more easily. And then another piece of this, you know, drought, flooding, extreme weather. You just have to wait and see what Mother Nature shows us. <laughs> it's not like we can do real studies and track that too much, but just keep an eye on that. That's another way to do that. Just see how it reacts. All right, and then the last of this that I've got is just kind of going through a little bit about some of the different research projects and soil testing that there are going on right now. Some of them have been going on for a little while. Um, there's, this is not comprehensive. I'm sure there's more that I did not include. Not, none of these are specifically for soil health. Um, they're just other kind of soil testing that I wanted to mention. Um, so we have, you know, in some of these are NREF funded, where we have you know, updating the P and K recommendations that Dr. Marganot at UVI is working on, uh, the MRTN updating that using some new computing tools to look at more historical data. Uh, Dr. Patty Guan at UVI as well, those are both through NREF. Uh, this is a newer project um, that is, you know, multiple, is it, multiple organizations are all contributing to for Miami recommendations, improving those in Illinois. So improving a lot, that's in the agronomy handbook and these numbers, so it's gonna be clicky for those. And then ISA, so Illinois Soil Association, we have a lot of projects on different kinds of conservation um, projects and how to, to make that work with soil health. Not really as much directly on the soil health other than what we have with our on-farm traveling network. And so this is kind of an ongoing development that we're doing. We have these legacy trials that are um, kind of long-term cover crop no-till where we are, you know, having replicated trials where we are looking at some of these soil health tests and we'll hopefully have good data from those going forward in the future. Um, and as Stephanie already mentioned, we're gonna be talking about that a lot more at the Soybean Summit, so make sure you register for that. That's on February 1st in Champaign. Um, and then another piece of this that I wanted to mention, you know, for us, and I say, we do have a soybean production concern survey, and we're gonna have that up here. There's the QR code if you wanna go ahead and do that. For farmers, retailers, tell us what you want to know more about. What are your issues? What do we need to do more research on? We wanna make sure that our checkoff funded research is helping the farmers in Illinois. So that's a good way to give, get that back. I think that's gonna be up a few more times, maybe on the, the slides in the room during the break and things like that. 
but um, make sure you fill that out at some point. And that's all I have. I don't know how I'm doing on time for questions. Yeah, I currently have time for a question or two. Anyone? Yes. We got a microphone. <laughs> Can we increase microbial activity in the soil by adding sugar to that soil to feed the microbes, especially in low organic matter soils? Okay, so there are, I mean, there's a lot of biologicals out there that have that same premise. I'm not sure that sugars would be our best thing because we want maybe more complex molecules. So right now, already in our soils, you probably have plenty of bacteria in those soils that are going to go after that easy to eat sugars. So adding sugar, it'll stimulate those, but you already have those. That's not the problem. Really what you want and what we need to develop is the more diverse microbial community. We want ones that are going to go after some of those cellulose and lignin and some of those more complex compounds. So. That's where I think there are a few of the biologicals out there. I hate to tell you to go for something that's more expensive, but in this case, I think that's, that's where there's more promise, where we are maybe feeding the biology stimulate that, stimulating that biology to come in, but not just the bacteria that eat the sugars. We want all of them. We want to get that diverse microbial community because more microbes doesn't help if they aren't doing all of the different functions. So we want a bigger microbial community, but we want a more, even more important is we want a more diverse microbial community. I hope that answers your question. I do not have a name of any specific ones. I need. I mean, that's something that's still ongoing. I think there's some promise for some of the different ones that are like humic acid based and things like that. I don't have a specific recommendation though. Okay, um, if you didn't hear that, the, the question was, should those be available? What time of the year should those be available? Um, I think it kind of depends a little bit maybe on what the components of that. Um, addition, uh, amendment that you're adding. You know, if you're adding it specifically so there's nitrogen released, then you'd want it more at planting so it gets broken down and released. But if you're doing this specifically for building up your microbial community, I would do it, you know, just like when you would with a cover crop. You want to feed them the rest of the year. You want to make sure, you know, if you're not doing a cover crop or even if you're doing a cover crop, adding it out there in the fall or something like that, that might be the best time for it. It really depends on probably the product itself. But I would say for the most part, you were wanting to fill in the gaps to help, you know, in our traditional conventional systems, we have openings, we have gaps, we have bare soil, we're not feeding the microbes that we want to fill in those gaps. So whatever we're using, we want to try to do that first. That's what I would recommend. Okay. Any more questions? Yes. <laughs> you talk about soil health. What about you're talking a lot sounds like the top two inches in your topsoil and they, they rise and what as you go deeper into soil and subsoil and aggregation and you're gonna have less activity down lower because there's less oxygen. But um, so when you're talking about this, even these tests, what what about the subsoil and what about the topsoil and how does the whole thing play in? I mean, you're just looking at it sounds like you're looking money at the topsoil, but you look there's a lot going on below that in the subsoil and right. with longer, deeper roots and certain cover crops go deeper rooted and you have yes. worms going deeper. There's probably no less, less organic matter down there, but mm -hmm. so what about the subsoil and, and what are you looking at for health in the topsoil? Well, how many inches? Because sometimes your topsoil is only a few inches and sometimes it's, it's really deep in the, right. in the bottom of the ground. So that comes back to a question that I have worked with quite a bit on these tests. You know, there is a certain, um, I guess, 
gut instinct for me to go with, we really don't need, if you're testing these, for the most part, we're, we are looking at this top, maybe two inches, maybe four inches. Generally, most of these tests get recommended to do the six to eight because it's just easier to sample at the same time, like the same way that you're sampling for fertility. Although some of them have very different instructions, you have to pay attention to what the lab indicates. But for the most part, when we're doing this over our soil, you are looking primarily at the surface soil, the top soil. It's just the in some cases the top couple of inches because as you said, as you get further down into that soil, there's less oxygen available, there's less organic matter, so there's not as much that they're doing. In the, you still have microbes in the subsoil, they're just not as concentrated, and that spatial variability comes into play even more in this in the subsoil. A lot of the times they are concentrated in those earthworm channels, in those root channels near the roots, and the rest of the soil, there's even less in between the roots in the subsoil. So for the most part, it's kind of, it's not really worth it to sample as much at the subsoil, because it's really a product of what you have at the surface and making its way down through those root channels, through those earthworm channels. And they're so scattered that if you do a, you know, a sampling from the surface, you can't always know where those are to hit them or not. So that's why we tend to concentrate on the surface because if you have improved your soil health at the surface, that's going to trickle down to the bottom. Now, it's probably worth it to consider roots and like cover crops and getting you know deeper subsoil, um, rooting and things like that with the, the cover crops that you choose to help with that. Particularly, you know, in certain parts of the states where they have clay pants or have other issues further in the soil now where they have less topsoil you know, things like that. But it's probably not worth doing a separate sampling for, for soil health testing. Okay, I think I'm out of time, probably should go on. But thank you so much for your questions. I hope you guys learned a lot about that. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, welcome Stephanie Porter back. She's going to be our next uh, presenter. So a brief introduction. Um, Stephanie is an expert in her field with over 20 years of uh, experience in agronomy and plant pathology. She holds master's degrees from the University of Illinois. She's a certified crop advisor and was named the 2018 Illinois Certified Crop Advisor Master Soybean Advisor. Uh, so I'll go ahead and turn the mic over to Stephanie uh, for her presentation, From Field to Future, Lessons from the 2023 Growing Season. Thank you so much, Stacy. Uh, if everybody wants to stand up and stretch, this is your time. How about that? I'm afraid I'm afraid to fall asleep. <laughs> All right, for those of you that are online, and are worried about CEUs, do not fret. Everything is going to be okay. We're gonna give out some information for you to get your CEUs. And also for the recording, um, if you want to get CEUs, we have instructions on how you can self-report on lsoyadvisor.com. You can go to our events page on lsoyadvisor.com, click on Soybean Summit, or click on Better Beans. And I have instructions there on how you can self-report your CEUs as well. It's pretty easy, I've done it. All right, I'm gonna get started. Maybe we are taking a break now. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna cover a lot today. Uh, a lot of different things. And so I don't want you to get overwhelmed. I'm gonna concentrate on Central Illinois, um, but we are running around um, in the entire state. I'm fortunately located in South Central Illinois, so I can run down south. Um, sometimes I run north when I'm here. I consider this Northern Central Illinois. Um, so up next, if anything I talk about today we will have some kind of information, some kind of content, some kind of outreach on lsoyadvisor.com. And you can get there. Um, our main source of information and content would be the Bill Notes blog. All of that goes out through a newsletter or social media 
on Twitter, as well as Facebook, thanks to Miss Kelsey, Kelsey Litchfield. So big shout out, Kelsey, thank you. Um, if you will want to sign up for our newsletter, you can go to the Elsewhere Advisor website on your phone or your computer. You scroll all the way down and you can put in your information and you can get a newsletter from us um, that way. But if you prefer social media, a lot of the same content's going out that way as well. I also want to give a shout out today to our uh, Soy Envoys. So if you're a Soy Envoy, if you want to stand up, um, please do. We've got Miss Karen Corrigan here in the house as well as Chris Ehler. Uh, they are wonderful resources, and I just want to give them a big thank you for helping out to, to some of this content um, is there on Elsewhere Advisor, um, and thank you for your time this year. And you might even see their names in my presentation um, as we go through it. Also, I want to give a shout out to the Soy Envoys for participating in a new endeavor, um, which is an online crop report. This currently is also on our El Soy Advisor website. And this is the agronomy team, as well as Soy Envoys and others, even board members every once in a while, reporting what they're seeing, what pests they're seeing, what growth stages they're seeing, what issues they're seeing, weather, um, and so on. And so this was our first year with that um, project. And then my favorite part, if you don't know where anything is and you just want to search for it on our website, we have a new online library. We haven't really promoted it much yet. But if you want to say, for example, uh, the hot thing seems to be red crown rod. So put red crown rod in there and all the information that we have on red crown rod pops up on elsewayadvisor.com. So this is how we're going to start out. Thanks, Chris. This is, this is all you, right? So the season started out where we have a lot of people in Central Illinois planting early and we had some people have some issues uh, with some frost early on um, and so on. And, and by May 23rd, we were starting to see some drought creep in a little bit um, in Western Illinois as well. And then uh, Dr. Connor Sybil, it was very cool and wet and he had reported, for example, those that had put on some P and K early, that they were seeing some good responses to that, just because of the cool conditions. One of my first field visits was in the Pekin area. Um, and when I went there, the, the big red flag for me was, holy crap, they're already running in their irrigation. And that's not normal if you run and look at fields uh, as an agronomist in Illinois. And that's when it kind of uh, resonated with me that we could have issues coming in. Another thing that happened in May 26 is we had really, really low humidity. And that's not normal either, right? And so as we head on um, into the season here, uh, we had a, a plant started growing. They started to take up more moisture. And so as Trent Ford said here, um, we were really starting to get in trouble and we were setting ourselves up because of the lack of rain as, and as well as those plants taking up all that moisture um, for a flash drought. Um, we were getting very, very little, if we did get precipitation, very, very little amounts. Um, and we were were lucky enough on our farm to be in that green spot there that had gotten a little bit of moisture, but we were very abnormal as usual um, compared to the rest of the state. Uh oh. Um, so at this time, we have a board member um, that had, you know, we're like, how's everything going? We're checking on the crops. You know, in Central Illinois, we have good black dirt, good water holding capacity. At this time, crops were doing pretty good. Um, and so we were okay. Um, at this time, uh, Chris Ehlers, soybeans were blooming, right? Uh, our early planted beans on May 31st. But we had lots of questions uh, from farmers coming in saying, oh my gosh, we have no moisture in the ground. Um, should we be spraying residuals? And some of the extension people I know were tweeting out, it's gonna rain, it's gonna rain, right? Don't worry, it's gonna rain. And then it just not rain. It did not rain. 
and then Karen wrote a nice article that was very dry, and then it was becoming hot, and we need to do our post sorry, post herbicides. And how do we handle that situation? And then, of course, those pesky Japanese beetles started to be seen around June 13th, reported by uh, our director, Abigail Peterson. And so as we entered in here, um, you can see we were in pretty good um, for trouble here. We had major uh, dryness. We were about to break records. Um, across the portion of the Corn Belt, as you can see there. Uh, we did get some rain around this period of time between June 6th and 12th, but it was mostly the south of the state, not in this area, across central Illinois, I should say. And so on June 14th, between April 1st and June 10th, it was now the second driest on record um, compared to 19, next to 1988. Uh, we were starting to see some rootworm injury in the Champaign area, which didn't help matters. If you don't have roots, you can't take up water. And that's not good. Um, and then on June 18th, we did get slight rain, but it was only in Western Illinois and Southern Illinois. And then on June 19th, or around so, that area, uh, Chris Ehler, and Dr. Hager started to report issues with herbicidaria over it. It had been dry the previous year, dry this year. They were seeing carryover symptoms of certain herbicides in soybeans. And then towards the end of June, one of the major questions was why are all my soybeans yellow? And so we did a lot of talking about on field days about potassium, drought-induced potassium deficiency. Lots of questions on that. Why are my soybeans yellow? So it wasn't that necessarily the lack of potassium in your field. It was just we didn't have moisture to uptake the potassium. However, we did have some other things going on, and I'll get into that in my presentation, um, that can also cause the same symptoms. Um, but for now, that's pretty much what was going on for the most part. We had worries about spider mites. I know we started blogging about spider mites. They did have major issues with spider mites in Western Illinois and Southern Illinois. And who can forget the haze, right? So June 28th, I know it happened throughout the season, but that was a major issue as well. And we did have some beetle feeding in some areas uh, that, that happened. And then lastly, and I know this is what an issue in our own farm, my brother actually was texting me and he's like, I just don't know, I don't, we don't, it's so dry, our corn looks bad, I don't know if I should spray, there's no, nothing out there. And so then, on June 29th, the bean mobile was at our first field day and there was a thing called a derecho while we were there. Everybody, Connie, I don't know how you forgot, but I will never forget. We were in a shed and this, we were able to carry out our field day. It was a very nice day. And that little red dot where you point to where that the, the wind gusts got up to 65 miles per hour, we were on the shed. So we bonded that day, team meeting, right? And then after that, we got copious amounts of rain. And I want you to kind of look, this map, when I start showing pictures of diseases, it really will match up to some of those areas where you see 2.58, 2.8, 2 inches, 3.3, 3, 3.1 inches. Some areas of central Illinois got some significant amount of rain. And then northern Illinois actually got a lot more even after that. So we started to see some fungicide helicopters for that early, early planted corn. We were one of those people that planted corn the first week of April on our own farm. Um, and then there was a lot of questions, including my own brother, like why the heck is the, the corn so short this year? And you know, it's, it's okay, it's dry, it's gonna be okay. Gotta help them through it, right? It's gonna, it can yield, but um, we had people tweeting about how, you know, 
Rose should be closed by this time with soybeans. And it, it wasn't happening by July 4th. It just wasn't happening. And our post herbicides were being sprayed. And then something happened where we got all this rain and all these plants started to grow really, really, really fast. And I had done a field visit and <laughs> you're gonna see a picture of really, really sad looking corn coming up, but that corn grew right out of it when it got that rain. Grew right out of those oopsies, what I call them. And so we had issues where we didn't know if we usually need to apply fungicides, insecticides at R3. And soybeans were at R3, but when we got that amount of rain, they grew more and went back into R1. So there was a lot of questions. You know, we didn't have the little pods on top. They were blooming on top of it. So should we spray or should we not spray? Just weird things going on. And then by July 11th, half of Illinois was in drought, just despite the rain. Even though we got a copious amount of rains in areas, we were still in a drought. It just wasn't enough at that time. So I got a call from actually, I was referred to this person, um, and I went to his field in Fithian. And he was a, a good farmer. And he said, you know, this is an arm. No, this is a, an issue. He's like, everybody's soybeans are turning yellow. And it's just not just me. And we rode around and looked at a lot of fields. And uh, a lot of people would say that this was uh, um, autism, potassium, or deficiency, or whatever drought induced. Um, but this was something more. And so we did look into it. And I'll go in further into that in, in the presentation. And then another field visit that I got called on on July 11th was in Waterman. And this was a fun field call because it was completely just pouring when I went into the field. And this was my chance, my only chance. I didn't want to have to drive that far again. And so I went out to the field and I looked, but I was unable to take soil samples at that time. The farmer came out, great farmer. He said, I looked in the book. I think this is Fusarium, but they call Fusarium well. And I said, I think you're right. And so I said, but I really want you to send it off to the lab and tell me, uh, you know, and, and let's rule, make sure it's not. Um, so the thing with Fusarium wilt, and at this time, a lot of people were sending off plants to a plant clinic, not necessarily U of I, Purdue, Iowa, Missouri, and some agronomists were sending off to multiple labs. And so they were calling me up and they're like, Stephanie, I'm sending this off. Um, people are calling this Mitophthora. Uh, I'm getting results back saying it's Fusarium. And in some cases it was Pythium, Fusarium, Rhizoctonia. So what happens, uh, soybeans get stressed and you're gonna have, and they're sitting in water, you're gonna get a lot of pathogens attacking them. And then what happens is people stop there. And so in my past, Fusarium is not a primary pathogen in Illinois at this time. I'm not gonna say it never will be, but in my mind, this is a red flag there's something else going on in that field. Yes. Was this a low lying area in the field? I can verify that because uh, I was standing in water. That was that hot in my boots. So, yeah, this is a low lying area. And guess what? This and this also came back Fusarium and it grew out of it. This made 70 bushels to the acre. This grew out of it and it was fine. I was never able to go back to soil sample that. I did this one, and I'll tell you about it later. Leave me in suspense. So at this time, what the heck was going on? So on July 12th, basically, I call this day root rot mania, right? Everybody and their dog, every agronomist, every farmer, everybody was tweeting about it. They were finding root rot everywhere. And so one of the main things I think that happened first and some of the pictures that you just saw was Karen Corgan shared this tweet with me. And I think it's, it, 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 it's not exactly what happened, but it's similar. So basically we had a lot of rain. There's a lack, a lack of oxygen to the roots. And basically plants weren't getting nitrogen. They were yellow in some cases. They were stressed. They were sitting in water and they were getting some pathogens. 
But then we also started to get reports of Phytophthora all over the Midwest, not just Central Illinois. The other thing that I don't want anybody to forget to do, because we do this so often when I go to field visits, is everybody wants to look above ground. When you first go to the field, you have to look below. And it's not just for pathogens, it's not just for soybean cyst nematodes. It's for actually seeing if there's any kind of compaction. So this is a picture that I received from Chris Casey, but it's much, much later in the season and there's probably other things going on. But one of the things you need to do is make sure they didn't mud it in and you're not seeing signs of compaction. And yes, this is much more commonly seen in the south or where they have less darker soils. Um, but one thing that can cause lack of nutrients to the plant is when you don't have a good root system. And the other thing that we learned this year is that we saw a lot more potassium symptoms, uh, deficient systems, symptoms, earlier in the season because that's when one fourth of the uptake. So basically the plant was starving for it at the time. And then at this time, at, or when we got hit potting, we started to see some yellowing because that's when uh, most of the nitrogen uptake occurs during potting as well as the phosphorus uptake. That's a whole nother presentation, so we'll move on. So this time, um, on our own farm, we were seeing some pollination. It was time for insecticide on July 14th, insecticide. Still some spider mites popping up in some areas. On our own farm, I mean, we still didn't see any major disease on soybeans. We were seeing some septoria brown spot. Of course, we always have that on our farm. And then the double crops, man, they were loving that rain, right? And that's a little bit abnormal for us. So we were excited about that double crop. Um, but basically, July 20th hit, and we were seeing major root rots. As I said before, root rot mania. The other thing that popped up was red crown rot. And so, the, you know the disease triangle, right? So, the disease triangle, we had perfect conditions. We had a susceptible host, we had the pathogen there, and we'll talk more about Phytophthora in a minute, but basically we were seeing perfect conditions for a whole bunch of root rots. We were starting to see grain fill on July 27th on our early planted corn in central Illinois, but by this time, it's just hotter than heck out there in the field. But still seeing a lot of drought. Um, I know that the Phytophthora showed up a lot earlier than this, but this is one of the field visits that I went on. Um, this is soybean variety that I'm very familiar with. I was a previous soybean product manager. We sold a lot of this soybean, uh, three, 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 three in Ohio. If you're not familiar with Ohio, it's the mecca of Pythium and Phytophthora. And this soybean did well there. And so they called me out, um, previous co workers. I went out in the field. Kelsey got to go with me. It was so fun. She loved it. Um, and this field, at first, she was like, oh, it's, it's not a big deal. And then we start going in, and we're like, oh, crap. And I'm like, this is Phytophthora. Of course, they sent it out off. That's fine. Get a second opinion. It was Phytophthora. And so this is not some a normal occurrence. This Phytophthora, you have two phases. You have an early phase of Phytophthora, and we have seed treatments to help with that, right? We like seed treatments. But then seed treatments wear off. They don't last forever. And then Phytophthora has another second phase where it kills adult plants. And, and certain varieties can have good natural tolerance to Phytophthora, which is what I recommend you try to get now. And you also have lots of different levels of resistance genes that can go into this. And so what's happening, and it's very possible that we do have some Phytophthoras now that could be overcoming these genes. And so I'll leave it at that. And I've invited Dr. Martin Chilvers to come and talk more about that, as well as what I won't at our Northern Illinois Better Beans. So if you want to tune in to that, uh, to hear more there. And then on August 7th, 
Chris Healer started to report that we were seeing sinus syndrome, as well as he tweeted a picture of swimming cystic and toad like I had never seen before. Like, we see that stuff in the South all the time, right? But he was tweeting this stuff in Central Illinois. So uh, the drought, of course, can make swimming cystic and toads worse. Uh, I don't want to talk too much about white mold, but it was not something that we thought we would see in a dry year in Northern Illinois. It did happen. I know when I did a field visit, I asked the farmer, have you sprayed yet for white mold? And he said, I didn't get to. So it was raining, maybe possibly around the time where they could have sprayed and they weren't spraying, but I'm not sure what all happened. We had heard some conditions for white mold. We had some gosses wilt show up on our farm and corn. But at this time, double crop soybeans still look good and they're flowering. Very exciting. And then it's getting late. It's August 28th. We are at the Farm Progress Show, and I'm still getting texts that they were spraying in East Central Illinois for bean leaf beetles. And then lastly, we did have charcoal rot show up in some areas. Um, I didn't hear a lot about it mostly in the west and the south, but not to say it couldn't show up here in central Illinois. Um, so, my slide's showing up weird here. So at this time, on July 19th, I was, around this time I was at uh, Ore Field Day, at U of I Field Day, and I was wanting to learn more about a disease called red crop rot. And Dr. Carl Bradley from Kentucky was there, and at the same time I'd met a gentleman from Nutrien, who was extremely interested in red crop rot as well. And we happened to sit next to it, each other. And at that time, we both at the same time started to get texts that people were starting to find red crown rot in Illinois. Um, he was from, covered Missouri and Western Illinois. They haven't technically that I know of found red crown rot in Missouri. They think it's probably there, right? And then Abigail, I tell Abigail, my our director texting her and she sends me this picture right here and i was like abigail do you know what that is or that could be i mean i don't know for sure i was like that's really red and she's like well i just found it in one of our plots which is in Mawikwa, very close to where i live so where where do you think i went that night so um I, this is austin Rinker's farm i ran down there it's very close to my house um and we went to the field and I actually went to uh, um, this field next where there's stew there. Um, and Austin goes, you're in the wrong field, Stephanie. I'm like, I know, but do you see this? He goes, this is my neighbor's field. So this field was planted earlier and it was much more progressed. And I said, I've never seen my crop rock before. I'm sorry, I was nerding out and Austin had to chill out, sorry, Austin. But, um, but then we started to look at his fields and he said, we couldn't find it. So I called Abigail. At this time, we couldn't see it from the field. You couldn't see it from the car. Abigail had scouted these fields. We had to do this. And at the beginning of the field, that's how we found it. And then Austin said, I wanna look at every one of my soybean fields. So that evening we drove to seven fields of his and we found red crown rot in the entryway of all but one field on his farm. And so um, basically, um, I had taken Stu back, I bet Stu is in the house, and I wanted to have him, you know, you try to do your best, right? You want to give him good symptoms. You want to get a good picture. And he's looking at these roots and he's like, Stephanie, they're not red. I'm like, I totally disappointed Stu, I'm sorry. But they didn't look like the typical symptom. I think with the drought and the stress, these roots were deteriorating quickly and fast. And we'll talk about the little red par paradisia, the fruiting bodies that were on there. We couldn't find those hardly at all this year. And that's like one of the key diagnostic symptoms um, that we, we found. So what is red crown out? So, Quick history lesson. Um, it was first detected on peanuts in 1966 in Georgia, causing disease known as black root rot. Later in 1972, this pathogen was found um, to cause issues in soybeans, and they called it red crown rot. 
and it had other names as well. One that I've heard is Black Root Rot. And then in 2017, technically 2018, Dr. Nathan Klecheski reported this disease for the first time in Illinois in Pike County. And then, since then, in all the red counties, you can see 2019 to 2021, it was being found throughout the state. We just, we had been reading a little bit about it. It just wasn't on our, maybe perhaps our own farm at that time, and we were as concerned. Um, and now at this time, it's also being found in Kentucky, as well as now found in Indiana, as well. So, if, uh, go back to that slide. Yes. So, Clay County must have some kind of infecting device. I don't know, or maybe, we, look at it. maybe we just haven't found it yet. Maybe next year, I don't know. Um, so, I had met up with Robert Bellum earlier in the year. He's former U of I Extension. And it's funny how you, you meet, I'm meeting up with all my previous coworkers now, so that's fun. And he had been dealing with this disease now on, in his retirement as he's been working on brace farms in Madison County. And I said, tell me everything you know. I wanna know everything. So he did. And so a little bit about this disease is it infects early, and I like to compare it to sun death syndrome because that's one of the first diseases I ever knew on our farm as a little girl, right? So SDS, it's very similar. When SDS infects, it likes cool temperatures. This is the opposite, it likes warmer temperatures. So that's one of the main differences. But other than that, it's very similar. And then when you get bloom to pod, um, the fungus, you have to have rain, you have to have water. What did we have the 1st of July? Big rain. Then that fungus that's in the base of the plant or that can STS, it sends up a toxin and it makes these symptoms that we'll see in a minute show up on the plant and then later on it will produce these red kind of parathesia fruiting structures and those are actually the survival structures that fall back into the ground and so it's there it's there for a long time they've said like seven years i think it's just probably it's it's there right like soybeans and snow toad so the other problem is is that not only does red crown rot cause this intervenal necrosis, but so does sudden death syndrome, so does brown stem rot, and so does stem canker. Okay, so at this time, and as you got later into the season, the main issue was that everybody was cause, calling this red crown rot. And there was a lot of agronomists and a lot of people getting very upset because there was people misdiagnosing this. And so at that time, we learned that we really needed to do more work and a review. I did a presentation not too long ago at North and they're like, wow, you're bringing up a lot of stuff that I haven't seen in a while. Um, but we saw it this year out in the field. The other thing that ha happened later in the season, I was reminded by Chris Ehler, is that you can also have soybean variety sensitive to triazole by biotoxicity. And that can also look the same. It can also have that intervenal necrosis in hot, dry conditions. This was later in the season. Just want to note that, August 4th. And so when we see diseases, so here's the lesson, right? So if you don't see any kind of uh, uh, issues on the, no external symptoms on the stem, you split the stem, right? And if it's brown, it's brown stem rot. And normally we would say, if it's not brown, it's STS. But now it could be STS or red brown rot, right? And then the other thing that I kind of think I got maybe misdiagnosed is we have a little pest called the stem borer. I want to note that it comes in late August, early September. But if you cut the stem on a stem borer, it's brown. And later in the season, that little pest, that little larva, it may not be there. And so people may call that brown stem rot as well. And then next up, I had people in Northern Illinois that were having sun death syndrome issues and people kept wanting to call it red crown rot. So it was a major issue. Sometimes soy SDS, if there's moisture, you can see this blue kind of cool fungal uh, not always. We saw it this year because of the moisture. 
It's not a key diagnostic symptom because it's not always there. But the other thing to remember is at the end of the season with SDS, it will drop leaves. All the other diseases will hold on to their leaves. And so that's another difference. But what it comes down to is sometimes we just don't know for sure. And so we were encouraging people to submit samples to the U of I plant clinic. And at that time, Dr. Uh, Clow, Stephen Clow at USDA ARS was doing research on red crown rot. He reached out to me, he said, somebody said, I need to call you. And he said, I will pay for their fee. So we tried to put that word out. If you can send off a sample, print off a form, it's gonna be free um, to send it into the plant clinic. And so by this time, later in the season, I was writing articles that said, sudden death syndrome still exists because people kept calling everything red crown rot and it wasn't. We did still have those other diseases out there. And in this specific case, I was provided by Chris Casey awesome amount of information. He was that second person where that farmer had called and said, this guy kept saying I'm red crown rot and I think it's SDS. What do you think? And he provided me all this information. It was two different varieties. You can see differences in varieties. One had SDS seed treatment, one did not. That'll make a difference as well. And so he had actually did send it off the plant clinic and it was indeed sent his syndrome. Now, if you see a plant out there that does have blotches on the stem, then it could be Phytophthora, stem canker, or white mold. So stem canker, I'm finding a lot of that as an agronomist in the last 10 years. Um, and so I think this is a, a disease that's often misdiagnosed. It shows up later in the season, and it basically causes these major cankers on the stem. And it, again, can cause symptoms. I think it could very much so look a lot like right crown knot. And the above ground symptoms look just like right crown knot. And so one of the best pictures of stem canker I saw and I grabbed was, and you don't always see this, but stem canker is best diagnosed when the plant's green. And unfortunately, as an agronomist, I've been called out when it's turned and it's harder to diagnose it, but when it's green, you can see that, that cankering, that black on the stem, and it can also be confused with Phytophthora. The other thing with this disease is I wanna point out that there's a lot of different things that you can do to help with this disease, and this is a good example. And so one of the things is that you can have a disease history of this disease. Um, it can come in on seed, like a lot of diseases can. It can be worse with a higher population, kind of like white mold, for example. It also can have alternate hosts and weeds. Um, I had another freak disease I didn't want to talk about that was happened this year, and it showed up on all the fields that the farmer had mowed, and it was a perfect pattern. It had came in from, from the, the ditches. Um, fungicide with this disease. Maybe it might help fungicide if you do it early, but most of the time we're doing it R3, and so it probably doesn't gonna help. Uh, another example with this disease, it likes high fertility. Um, I've seen it in fields with no-till as well. I talked to one of our board members that had it in a no-till field and not other fields, because no-till fields only. Um, another disease that likes high fertility that I can attest to is white mold as well. So when you look at two different varieties, you can see that who has ever heard of scores, a score of a disease. Does anybody raise your hand if you look at disease scores? Anybody in this room? So disease scores do matter. Uh, as a former product manager, we do take and do a lot of testing on diseases. I won't go into it, but they give them scores. In this instance, there's two varieties here. One is good and nine is the worst. So we have scores for Phytophthora brown stem rot, soybean white mold, sun death syndrome, broad eye leaf spot, for example. However, we may not have scores for charcoal, charcoal rot or phomopsis, for example, that was mentioned previously. 
The other thing that's showing up to make sure to note is seed treatment. I think that's a thing that doesn't get asked. We need to make sure, does this have Olivo or Saltro on it? Take note of that. Saltro is not no, labeled, not only for SDS and um, SEN, but also for Red Crown Rock now. And Olivo is being used in the West for it as well, and it covers SDS as well as SCN. The one thing I wanted to point out and I run into is with scores for, um, for stem canker. So sometimes it won't have a score for disease. The one thing to note is there's two, at least two, probably more different pathogens, different types of stem canker. When seed companies score those, they're scoring for southern stem canker. What if you have northern? So that complicates things. So back to these field visits. Here we are. So think they've already been sent off to a plant clinic. Those had fusarium, right? I did it myself. But I also took a soil probe out and I soil tested good areas and bad areas of both these fields. And what happened was, A, I did not soil sample when it was dry just so you know, because you not, may not get good, good results. I waited till it had adequate moisture, but what I was finding is very low pH. And when I followed up with that farmer over there, he's like, well, I haven't limed in a while. And so this is something I was running into a lot in both corn and soybeans. And not only did it have low pH, guess what? It had high amounts of SCN as well in those areas, the bad areas, and also, Poor nematodes, moderate level spiral nematodes. And there could be more problems, but I kind of stopped there. So the moral of the story is, is don't stop at just the disease. Sometimes it's flagging it. There's other things wrong out in the field. So I did write a blog about this low pH visit that I did, and you can read more about it um, if you want to go to it. But what it boils down to, when you have low pH, you can have issues with your nutrients. You can start to have toxicity. You can start having nutrient deficiencies. You can start messing up issues with your herbicide. You can get certain herbicides, not all of them. Sometimes you can have carryover. You're gonna start messing with your soil health, right, Stacy? Which is what something she totally touched on because it messes up with those microbes that she already talked about earlier. And then we just did a webinar not too long ago with Andrew Marganot, and he totally hit on this too. If you ever want to check it out, it's on lsoyadvisor.com. But I kind of snapped his slide there, but soybeans are generally more sensitive to soil pH than corn. And long story short, you can also have issues with pathogens, which is another thing Stacy touched on as well. So we can just start to have some major issues there. Now, bear with me, this is not gonna happen here in this area, but when you start getting in South Central Illinois, this is the other thing I ran into. So the gentleman on the right was a Twitter follower, and he had first showed me a picture of yellowing soybeans. So I showed him to Karen, and I said, I think this might be herbicide drift, and she's like, I think so too. And so he's like, okay, great farmer. He's like,
And so now that I've mentioned soybean cyst nematode, we are funding the University of Illinois to have nematode testing. So I encourage you to take advantage of that, um, that program. You can go to free SCN testing at illinois.edu and you will get a, a form. And not only do we pay for the soybean cyst nematode sample, but we're also gonna pay the shipping as well. So please take advantage of that. Sure, as many as you want. Yeah. And so around September 1st, we started to see stem borer. Uh, Sean, who's up next, uh, started seeing responses to sulfur. And by that time, September 13th, we had alarming low river, river levels. So still a lot of drought in some areas. And then those who saw the black moths, uh, on September 28th, I did out the combine. That was the most popular question. I thought this was, the season was over, and that was our number one blog this year. <laughs> um, and so what those black moths were, were also, the, the, they were actually green clover worm moths. So with that, uh, Bob Rocker's show is over, and everybody can take a breath, right? It's <sighs> September 5th. We finally had a chance to go to Pike County. Pam Smith is originally from that area. She joined us and we met with a farmer that had, I call it ground zero, had been struggling with red crown rot since the beginning. This, these are the beginning fields. It's been here a while. It wasn't as bad this year, according to him. It looked really bad to me. Um, in this picture, you can see we, it's very, very deteriorated deteriorated, it's very, very hard to diagnose at this time. You do see some of those fruiting structures there. Um, at this time, the other thing that Robert Bellin had told me is when you go look for red crown rot, not only are you gonna find red crown rot, you're gonna find every other disease there too, which makes it much more difficult. And that's what we found in Pike County. We were finding sudden death syndrome, canker, stem canker, and we found red crown rot, which is, is probably the best uh, picture I have of those fruiting structures that really kind of scream to you to have red crown rot. So at this time, Dr. Stephen Clow, who is the USDA um, ARS service, is trying to collect samples. Up until now, this is not an official map. This is the map he has shared with me of the counties where we found red crown rot this year in the state. Uh, sorry for this busy poster. This is his poster that he shared. And basically what it tells is that up until now, almost 99.9% .9 of the isolate of red crown rot in Illinois comes, has come from the same source. It's just been spread across the state. And if you want to hear more from Stephen, uh, he's invited to our Red Crown Rock panel at the Soybean Summit, so I'm not going to talk much more on that. Now, this is one of the field maps that was shared with me by the farmer um, that we just saw previously in Pike County, Ground Zero. And so, this is the map, yield map. Um, and so, we can get some yield losses if that pathogen's been there for quite a while. You can kind of get an imagery of those purple, greater than 20 bushel loss. But we also have a lot of other weird things going on, questions that are unanswered. He's got that purple field up there that's really, really bad. Why isn't the field next to it bad? It makes no sense. He's got some fence lines that he tore out. And he said it's almost like the pathogen, pathogen doesn't want to cross that fence line or where that vegetation grew. Just really strange things. And even plant, path, uh, plant pathologists that grow the fungus on a medium, it changes. They said it's the strangest organism fungus that they've ever dealt with before. It's just different. And so yield loss is going to depend on a lot of different factors, but it's going to be dependent upon the present, how long it's there, the disease triangle, of course, and drainage. Matt Montgomery reminded drainage. And my brother is putting tile in my field right now. Yes, drainage. 
it will be worse with water. Um, at this time, I'm not aware of any variety separation. It seems to, um, in fact, a lot of different soybeans. Um, soybean system toad does make it worse. Soybean system toad makes a lot of pathogens worse. Brown stem hop, sudden death syndrome, and so on. And crop rotation does help. Oops, almost missed you, Pam. So basically when it comes down to red crop management, you want the correct identification. We need some drainage. Um, there's been speculation that maybe shorter season might help. I can't guarantee that. They're trying a lot of different things. Seed treatments, Dr. Carl Bradley is going to be coming to the Soybean Summit. You can share more results on that. They've kind of been mixed. Um, but for the, for the most part, that's all we have right now is seed treatments for this disease. Um, if you have it, sometimes we want to try to control soybean cyst nematode. Fungicides won't do anything. The main thing that we want answers to is that this pathogen could have a lot of alternate hosts, not just legumes. It could be woody type of things. The things we know now, peanut, alfalfa, papaya, koi, blueberries, indigo, um, and so on. And so stay tuned, we have a lot of work to do. And you may ask me a question and I may not know the answer. So with that, I'm just gonna conclude here is what did we learn this season? We learned we need to collect a lot of information. Don't just stop at uh, sending it off to the plant clinic. Do some more investigation. Test the good areas versus the bad areas. Um, take weather conditions into consideration. Uh, take note of the date that it showed up. It could be uh, abiotic environmental issue, it could be nutrient. Look at the field pattern. Don't just look at the leaf symptoms. You have to look at the roots. Rule out chemical issues, we had that too this year. It's okay to get a second opinion. That's fine, you can do it. There are differences between different soybean varieties. There are differences with seed treatments as well. And lastly, don't forget to soil test don't forget to apply lime. Pay attention to pH. And I'll leave it with, don't forget to test for SEN and more importantly, let's pay attention to sulfur as well. Right, Sean? We'll get there. Okay. So with that, I'm gonna conclude. Are there any questions? Have you noticed uh, tillage having Less crown root worm, I mean crown. Red crown root? Yeah. Is, is no till fields worse than, than tillage fields? I don't think there's any difference that I know of. No. No. Any other questions? Okay, with that, it is now time uh, before we break um, and move around and get to go to the bathroom. Um, I just want to remind you that there are drinks in the back of the room if you need a drink and snacks as well. So also during this break, I'm going to pass along information to you about the Lake Decatur Water Quality Incentive Regional Conservation Partners Partnership Program. This is a five-year program that provides substantial cost share and flexibility to landowners and growers for certain practices aimed at reducing sediment and nutrient losses to the lake. If you would like more information, please check out the flyer at the Elso Advisor table. Is Jeff Beckler here? Not that I know of. Um, and if you happen to find Jeff Beckler, you can talk to him more so about that. So we are going to take a break now. We will reconvene at 10.30. Is that right? Connie is shaking her head yes. Okay. All right. Thank you.
Every field is different, and so is every agronomist. We invite you to show us your style, creating content from your point of view, using your expertise to help 43,000 plus Illinois soybean farmers. Because you're already an expert, we invite you to become an envoy. Soy envoys are advisors and connectors, supporting Illinois soybean farmers in their goals of increasing yield and profits while minimizing environmental impact. You'll share information, advice, and in-season updates all through the power of our Illsoy Advisor platform. We can't wait to see how you make it yours. Apply today to be a Soy Envoy. Visit illsoyadvisor.com to submit an application by February 2nd.
everybody uh, to rejoin us here from the meeting area um, so we can continue our next presentation. So everybody file back in. <coughs> All right. So our last presenter today is my good, one of my good friends from college, uh, Dr. Sean Castile. He's an associate professor of agronomy and extension soybean specialist for Purdue University. Dr. Castile was born and raised on a family farm in East Central Illinois, and he earned his uh, Bachelor of Science in Crop Sciences at the University of Illinois and his Master's of Science in Crop Science um, in Crop Science and his PhD in Soil Science as, at North Carolina University. He's given over 850 invited presentations to 60,000 people across the country and world. <laughs> His practical research also extends to field scale trials with seeding rates, sulfur, and intensive management of soybeans. You can follow him on his podcast, Purdue Crop Chat, and now Twitter. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> and I try to share him as much as I can, at Purdue Soybean. At Purdue Soybean. So please join me in welcoming me, Sean. Appreciate the invitation to come talk with you guys. Yes, uh, make sure I don't turn it off here. It's nice to come back to the home state. Uh, so always enjoy coming over here and having conversations. Uh, you guys, Stephanie and I have been a long time friends and hadn't seen each other in years, many, many years. And so I uh, appreciate the opportunity to come talk and see you guys. Uh, you guys, if you haven't heard me speak before, I want a conversation. Clearly, I've got tons of slides, but I mean, if there's something on your mind that I'm not hitting, you know, ask me to interrupt me, I want a conversation, so if you don't know that about me, that's me. Um, I'm going to talk about high yield soybeans, so I'm going to talk about the sulfur side of it, and kind of expand upon that. So, within here, how many are actual just soybean farmers? How many are raising about an idea? Okay. All right, and then we have uh, agronomists, like company agronomists in the crowd? Okay. All right, and then anything in between? Okay, what's in between? Awesome. Okay, so we got a kind of pretty good split of farmers and agronomists. Uh, so that helps me. I assume everyone's going away. Okay, good. Yeah, so I'm from my case, that works. All right, so within this, having four screens, this is a new one for me, so that means have four screens. I've been across the room that's got three, but four. I walked in, I'm like, where am I going to sit? Okay, so good luck with me as I kind of be the nap going across the room. Here. Um, within here, so high yield management of soybeans, I want to set foundation, but then again, I definitely want to go above and beyond that. Uh, so when we look at something like this, uh, these are yields, right, these are bush and breaker, so there should be some fun things that come out of this when you start to see uh, 77 bush beans go to 99 and 100 bush beans. Uh, there's some fun things to talk about. Okay, so I'll get back to that. So just so you know, if the, the first few slides are boring to you, I have exciting things to come, okay? Uh, so within that, if you're talking about high yield soybean, what are some of the top management decisions that you're making or recommending? Say again. Plant early. What's early? Third week of May. I was going to say, we don't have to have a talk then, okay? Third week of April. No, you're good. Sorry, I put people on the spot all the time, so you can leave the room after this if you're embarrassed. So again, I grew up in Illinois, and the mentality was, I think most of us have this appreciation, it was plant what first, and then whenever the beans get in the ground, hopefully by Memorial Day. But that has changed, right? So planting earlier, so third week May, yeah, late May, late, see, you got me doing it now, right? Late <laughs> April, early May, that's a good spot. There's people that push it a little bit more. Planting date is huge on soybeans. We're gonna talk a little bit on that, not a lot. Okay, uh, what's another thing that you're looking at on high yield management of soybeans? Narrow rows, define narrow rows. Whoever said that. Say it again. 15 or less. Yeah, 15 inches or less. So I don't necessarily love drill beans, but the idea of it's about a canopy, right? That's the idea of what we're trying to do. We're trying to canopy. What, what canopy are we trying to do? We're trying to harvest sunlight, right? Transfer that over to flowers, transfer it over to the pods, right? What is knee high by the 4th of July? Corn. Your soybeans need to be green to die by the 4th of July. It's the canopy. It's the timely planting, right? Okay, that's coming to play. What else? We have a couple more and then I'll get my answers. Yeah. 
variety. There you go, variety selection, right? If you look at that alone, that's six to 12 bushel difference in a lot of cases, right? You've got to have the yield potential, the yield consistency that comes into play, timely planting, all right? Narrows, you guys hit my top three, right? Well, most of you got to hit the foundations and then continue moving on. Obviously, you want to talk about diseases, insects, weeds, those all come into play. Uh, scouting just to know what's going on. It's just not this crop that we rotate to. I think we've seen enough over the last five, ten years that it's the one that's making us money in many of the years. I know it's it's fun to have 300 bushel corn, but sometimes the, those 85 bushel beans are the ones that are making the money for the farm, right? Fertility, that's a huge one. That's one that I spend a lot of time on. I want to make sure that we have that understanding. But then we have this little thing called weather. Right? Did we have any weather this year? What was your June like? Dry, right? So then how do you deal with that? And then the soil that you're blessed with or cursed with? Depends on which way you want to look at it, right? I grew up on flat blacks, all right? So when I spent eight years in North Carolina, guess what they told me? I didn't know how to farm. They said, you just throw the seed out there and you'll get your 70 bushel beans and your 250, this has been a few years, so the numbers go up now, right? 250 bushel corn. And then I was like, what are you talking about? You've got to manage the ground that you've got. So some of you may be blessed with that same thing of good prairie ground. Some of you may be blessed with sand, but you, I did say that blessed with sand because that can almost be a system that you can manage so intensely if you've got access to water, right? If you don't, okay, yeah, it's a curse. So in those same days, I was putting a soil probe in the ground, 36 inches and nothing but sand. It's okay, maybe you got something here. Maybe I have to manage it differently than you do. But it's all about how do you work that together to be intentional. That's really what we're about. Okay, how do you manage that soybean? You can do this on corn, you can do this on canola, whatever you want, you've got to be intentional about it. It just doesn't happen, okay? So let's set the foundations and then to really expand. So setting the foundation. I made the comment, but here's just those take homes. Ah, all right, so on this screen, it's nice and black. On the big one, it's uh, blue, friendly blue. So, all right, that's probably what I'll read off of. All right, so six to 12 bushel swing on variety selection alone. Okay, just hitting that mark. Row spacing, so you talked about a serve 15 inches or less, right? I think as long as we're within that 15 inch, that's a good spot. 30 inch means can yield well, but boy, you better be planting those suckers time. Right? Because they're going to take a lot longer than a canopy to get that full yield advantage. Uh, the number that I normally put is about a 5 to 10% yield difference when I look at a 30 inch bean versus a 15 inch bean. Okay? Uh, I'll go ahead and answer some people say, well, there's 20 inch beans out there. What do you think about that? That's fine by me. 20 inch beans, I'm good with it. 15s, twin 30s, any of those kind of modified narrows, those are a good spot for us to be. Okay? Um, and then there's some interesting synergies that come out of that. So early on, a lot of people. We're looking at doing 30 inch beans because then I can run the rotator through without doing tire beans, right? Well, there's some interesting studies that have more synergy, more yield response to narrow row beans, so 15s, 20s, that type, than the 30s. So there's even more of a, an idea of let's push that intense management on those narrow beans. Plant stands, obviously, you got to have the beans out there, just setting this foundation and moving beyond. 100, 120,000 plants is more than enough, okay? In many cases, 85,000 plants. I've got 60 site years of data in uh, Indiana that our break is 85, 90,000 plants. We don't need any more. Okay? So, what, what do you need to do to get them there? Obviously, the seed treatment's coming to play. Timely planting, these are conservative numbers. I am from the university, okay? So, a four to eight bushel difference just on doing a timely planting versus maybe a three week delay. There's many cases that's way higher than that 10, 15 bushels, okay? A lot, of, a lot of us are kind of looking at maybe a half a bushel per acre per day when we're delayed beyond the middle of May, okay? I've got varieties that are straight linear decrease about nine tenths of a bushel per acre per day when we delay it beyond the first week of May. Okay, so timely planting is huge. What are we doing with that? Uh, the idea of nodes and canopy, right? And pod development, duration, solid foundation down. I want to have a good stand establishment so then those roots can access our nutrients and access our what? Can't access nutrients unless you have what? Moisture. In June, we didn't have moisture, right? But how were the stands overall in June? Pretty good. Stand establishment is what saved us this year, right? If you really think about it, we got a good timely planted crop, both in Indiana and Illinois. 
And for that matter, we both have the highest yield at state level across the country. Both high states do <laughs> by tie here this year, guys. All right, 61 bushel per acre at state level, highest uh, highest yield ever for Indiana. We tied at the state level. It's about stand establishment, the timely planting, but then we have a root system so they could weather the storm that we didn't have in June. So then we have nice heat fruit, so when rain came back in July and August, we could really yield well. So that access to nutrition, okay? All right, so let me go through a few of these uh, foundational things. So setting the foundation, you get the 15 inch row of R2 and a 30 inch row, all right? You already talked about this. Green die by the 4th of July. I want this sucker canopy by the 4th of July, okay? The idea is really I want to be matching up by the time I'm flowering out the top, okay? So I'm going to turn the beans. I want them flowering out the top, I want the canopy closed, okay? A lot of people might say, I want them flowering by, by or canopy by summer solstice which would be great. But I tried, I pushed, I done made uh, March plantings. It just, it's not a good scenario for us. For Georgia, okay, a little bit different. We've got a window where we can plant earlier. We've got enough growing season to really do that. If we're canopy by the end of June, beginning of July, that's a really spot, spot on place for us. So if you're to look at the 15 versus the 30 inch row, how many more days is it going to take this 30 inch row to close? How many think a week? 14 days. 14 days. Throw your 15. 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. Throw your 25, 25. 25 days, guys. 25 more days to close. Loss of what? Photosynthesis, photosynthesis that canopy, right? You think about the, the June we have this year, it's probably more like a 30 day to close. Okay, losing out on that sunlight, losing out on the moisture, and guess what else is creeping up through that canopy? Our weeds, right? All right, so that's what we're talking about. Timely planted, narrow rows, get the stand established. Um, a lot of these foundational things are now we're talking their own. So if I get a little excited, sorry, I'll try to reel back so that I only talk to two minutes on the slide instead of the one hour. Timely planting, this has been huge for soybeans, okay? We are tricking the plant with these timely plantings. I'm not calling early, I'm calling <laughs> timely. This is when it should be planted, okay? You're tricking the plant so then you can have more no development, so then therefore you have more pod development. What I mean by that is if you've got a 3-4 bean that you're running, planted on April 25th versus May 25th, those two are gonna to look totally different. Same exact variety, same maturity group, everything else. The earlier planting will normally get another two nodes, three nodes. So that instead of a 17, 18 noted plant, we're looking at a 20, 22 noted plant, okay? Now, some people might say, you're planting earlier. I hate when beans get tall, they get lodgy, they uh, flop over and we don't yield well. That is true. Earlier plantings do not do that though, right? They're actually shorter in most cases. Why in the world are those earlier planted beans shorter than, you know, in the May planting? Internode elongation, okay? What are the early internodes like? They're very stacked. What's the growing conditions like in the first week of May, usually? <clears throat> or April, last week of May, April. Cooler, right? They're not growing very fast. There's not that temperature to drive it. Soils are in that same way. So they become a very compact plant. In that compact uh, situation, you actually have better light penetration. So with that better light penetration, there's not shading going on. So then it actually starts to throw branches with the timely planting. So you're gaining more nodes, main stem nodes, you have main stem pods. You have more branches, you have more reproductive branches, okay? So you get into this canopy closure, it gives us time to close by when again? I'm between you and lunch, guys. <laughs> by the 4th of July, by the end of June, early July, I want that sucker canopy. Timely planting's gonna get you there. Reproductive duration. We're actually going to be in seed fill longer with the timely plant, same variety than we will with the late planted bean. Okay, so all that comes into play. Again, the, the general swing from about late April, early May, and you're going to make this comment already. Three tenths, four tenths of a bushel per acre per day in that mid May and beyond. So if you look at that 10 day window, that's easily going to get you in that four to eight bushel yield loss. Okay, of potential. Okay, so uh, earliest plantings on record. So I, I went back with the year that we had, we had a very timely planted crop and you guys did as well. And so here's just Indiana data. So five year average in terms of our planting progress, 
Uh, so here's uh, some of the other years that we've had, 1988, 91, 2012, even uh, 2012, even faster pace, right? So you said late April, and I got even more out there earlier. But you gotta have what to really get the full potential? The rest of the season, the water, right? What's similar about 1988, 91, and 2012? Draft, I, I remember 88 as a kid, right, draft. And then you've got 2018, 2020, 2021, and I put in 23 as well, also fastest. So these seven years are the fastest planting uh, progress we've had in Indiana. So you either have the drought, okay? Or you're gonna have the highest yields ever. <laughs> That's the scenario. You're gonna get this painted, so then you've got a, a scenario where you got yield potential. So in 88 to 12, we're anywhere from 12 to 30 percent off our yield trend. Versus 2018, we broke state record. This is Indiana data. So then we were at nine nine percent above yield trend at 57 and a half. 2020, we did it again. We broke another record, 10 percent above. 2021, we broke another record. Guess what? 2023, we broke another record. Okay, at state level. So this timely planting is a huge deal. And again, I appreciate you saying it, but I just want to just beat the dead horse. We better be planting these suckers timely. Okay, if you want high yield, yield potential, you got to get out there. In fact, I think the message has been so clear. There's a lot going on here, but just concentrate on this first column of all this heat map. Okay, <laughs> this is relative to corn. Okay, so the years 2010 to present. All right, when half the crop was planted. So when the corn was planted in 2010, beans were planted 30 days later. So that's kind of an anomaly. Let's go 2011 to 2016. We were about 10 to 14 days later. In other words, corn was planted first, and about 10 to 14 days later, we were getting around to doing soybeans in 2011 to 2016. And then finally, we hear, we hear the message in 2018, now we're within four days. We're within five days of corn. Okay, those kind of ring a bell too, that those are also our what? State record. So it's not just planting early, it's planting when field conditions are fit and timely, and planting them before the corn, okay? Or at least at the same time, okay? Because corn's a diva, all right? It just needs perfect conditions to get a nice uniform scan. Soybeans can kind of go through and, and work through those, those rough situations. Obviously, fungicide seed treatments need to be in play here if you're thinking about this. 2022 and 23, we're, we're right on top of each other. Corn and soybeans are planted at the same time at the state level. Uh, more times than not, I do have our farmers are planting beans before corn, okay? So again, just hitting that really hard, that timely planting is huge for our yield potential. Any questions on that before I move on? Okay. All right, so now I want to expand. I've hit the foundation. I want to go beyond. Uh, there may be a few in this crowd that get this joke, and there might be a few that don't. Okay, I see a few smiles. I do appreciate that. All right, so we're going to expand. We're going beyond the frontier. And so back in grade, so I think it's fifth grade for me, we had Oregon Trail. Anyone else have Oregon Trail? Okay, yeah. And I went online to find pictures of this, and I couldn't find, I, okay, I'm so old that mine was just, just a black screen and green. Anyone have that one? Help me out. Give, make a brother feel better. Okay, good. All right, but the only ones I could find had a little color to it. So you have the Oregon Trail, right? And what did you do as you were going across? You hoped you did not have dysentery, right? <laughs> Right, so eventually you're going through, you make these decisions as you go across Oregon Trail, get food and everything else. I found it interesting, I'll go back. April 25th, 1848, it was cool. What health was good, right? Uh, that's like our planting conditions. They're cool, but we're all right. We're gonna work through it. All right, so we're either gonna do the Oregon Trail or I was just giving a talk in Kearney, Nebraska a few years ago and um, they're, they're kind of expansion going west. I found this picture and took it, I took, it, took it and I thought it was kind of interesting. Old kind of, uh, any kind of automobile can go from New York to Chicago, but west to Chicago, the real trip uh, commences and that's where we became pioneers, right? That's where we're gonna push things beyond. So that's where we're going now. I've set a pretty good foundation, let's go beyond, okay? That's where we're going. All right, so uh, Stephanie already made the comment about sulfur, so that has been a big uh, part of my work in the last five, six years. And here's kind of the, the history and the whys of this, okay? So Clean Air Act 1990, all right, what does that do for us? Reduce sulfur emissions, right? Good thing I don't want to have the truck repainted every three years because of acid rain. So we don't have as much sulfur being deposited for free. 
Right, you got scrubbers that are coming into the industry, and so you get into this. So within the Midwest, right, uh, the I states, uh, let's go to Indiana first. We're upwards of 15, 20 pounds of sulfur being deposited in Illinois, which may be only 12 to 15. And then by 2015, we're less than five pounds of sulfur being deposited. Okay, so we've lost out on 10 to 15 pounds of sulfur now every year being deposited. Okay, when you think about this normally, all right, the ones that really crop to the top is going to be a corn and a wheat are going to be the crops that you really think about. Soybeans really never came up on the list until the last few years I've been looking at them and stumbled across them quite literally. Okay, so let's get into this. So here's the situation. We've got one on the left, highlighter green, and there was field after field like this, highlighter green, the whole field, and anyone sell varieties? Right? There's going to be some varieties that just look like this. And there's some varieties that look like the one on the right in the same variety trial. Right? So I didn't really think anything of it until I tried to do a rescue study where we had the opposite June. We had 20 inches of rain in the month of June 2015. And so everything was saturated, so I was trying to bring it back to life. And in that is where I stumbled across, and so where we've got some pretty good responses to sulfur and no sulfur. All right? So this site, I call it my sulfur playground, okay, across Indiana. Uh, that's a black sand, sandy loam type deal, two, two and a half percent organic matter. Um, by most, most traditional agronomy 101s, this should be a decently responsive site, okay? Here we've got the highlighter green. Okay, so the sulfur, right, is helping. It helps in a number of ways, but in particular, it's the nodulation that I want you to think about in the nitrogen supply, okay? So that same field, that same treatment's later in the season, so here's September 7th. Right, the untreated control, what do we already see? Leaves are starting to snest, starting to drop down. The ones on the right have this 20 pounds of sulfur up front, that nice dark green content, okay? So it's sulfur that's affecting nitrogen. Let me hit that again. It is a sulfur that is affecting nitrogen. Okay, sulfur is used as a macronutrient for every plant there is. It helps with nitrogen use efficiency in corn. It's very critical for any crop, right? You think about some proteins and enzymes and all that. But in particular, it goes to another level with soybeans. And here's what I'm talking about. I think the picture does it more justice. So uh, the one on the left is going to be 20 pounds of sulfur up front. And look at the roots and look at the nodules. Okay, we've got nodules that are like gobstoppers, right? We've got a nitrogen supply that is out of this world. So then when we come back, I'm gonna go back a slide, we still have a nitrogen supply at the end of the season, right? Versus, let me switch it again, one on the right, untreated control, hardly any nodules, right? So you don't have a good nitrogen supply. So by the end of the season, let me go back again, you're already senescing, okay? So that's on a field that's traditionally going to be short on sulfur, going to be short on nitrogen. Now, there's not every field that's like that. So here's the case of, okay, there's going to be those traditional low organic matter soils. There's going to be coarse texture soils. Those are the ones that will look at sulfur. But what about, I've got a good prairie dirt, John. You know, do I need to mess with this? Well, yeah, there's some situations that this is showing up too, and it's kind of fun. So let's get into that. All right. Background, so this will kind of tab through and give you a good kind of, here are the points that I really want you to understand. When we look at sulfur supply, roughly three to four pounds, it's probably more like two to three pounds of sulfur can get mineralized per year, okay, from each percent organic matter, okay? So if you run a 4% organic matter soil, how much sulfur are you gonna get from that? Okay, did you guys go to ISU or U of I or SIU here? Come on now. All right, 12 pounds, right? So we're looking at four times three. Uh, so that's the area that we're going to be. So that, that's not bad, but that's over the whole year. That's not right when the crop feeds it. That's over the whole year. So hear that. What about the plant residue? All right, is that doing something to mineralize or immobilize it? Okay. What's that nasty crop that we rotate after? I hit corn a lot. Just, just understand that, okay? That's fun. So we rotate after corn, right? Primarily. And so that's got a lot of what? A lot of biomass, a lot of carbon, right? So then let's put this in a situation. Most of us probably have an appreciation for a carbon to nitrogen ratio when we think about a nitrogen supply. How many have ever heard of a carbon to sulfur ratio? Okay, got a few. 
Not many, but I think that's the thing that we really need to start looking at. So carbon sulfur ratio in the residue, if it's less than 201, 200 parts carbon to one part sulfur, it's gonna mineralize that sulfur and become available. Versus if we've got something that's over 400 to one, we're immobilizing, okay? We're not having the sulfur become available. So it's being tied up. If sulfur is being tied up for soybeans, what's that affecting again? The nodulation. If it's affecting our nodulation, it's affecting our nitrogen. If it's affecting our nitrogen, your yields are going to get cut way down. Okay? Here's some good numbers to have in your back pocket. They're not absolutes, but they're good rules of thumb. Corn stove, we're about 350 to one. So we're already close to the edge at having sulfur immobilized just with the corn stove alone. Okay? You want to have something that's context. Uh, soybean stover is not nearly as high, 125 to one. Wheat straw is pretty up, 300 to one. What about cover crops? You want to run CRI, all right? What's one of the good things about, I mean, there's several good things and frustrating things all with this crop. So CRI, what's it doing for us? What's the reason you bring it into the system? You want to build organic matter, right? And so building organic matter, you need what? That carbon it brings with it, right? So it's bringing carbon to the system. So is it temporarily causing some issues as it builds long-term organic matter? So this is the balance, this is the dance that we do a CRI and any cover crop. So just understand that and we can manage that. All right, so cover crops, you know, if I terminate 12, 14 inches tall, I'm probably only gonna talk, oh, maybe two, 300 to one, 600 to one, depends on the content, right? And then if you let it go up to chest high, there's a lot more carbon now. And so we're gonna be immobilizing a lot more nitrogen and sulfur, yeah. About nitrogen, I know that the research is real mixed as far as any kind of a yield benefit on beans, and I saw you're using AMS. Yep. What about potassium sulfate or potassium thiosulfate? Yep. Options. Yep. So uh, he basically wants me to actually get the data and the results. So yes, we. we <laughs> I no, no, I appreciate it. Like, Eric, right, stop talking. Give me back. And I'll get to that. Okay. okay. So uh, in in this doing my job of trying to get a background, maybe I'm long winded. Uh, how much sulfur do we need? And I will get to the fertilizer choices on this. Okay, if you look at just a 75 bushel crop, and the grain alone is 14 pounds of sulfur, okay? But we need about double that whenever we look at the total. So we look at the stover, and we look at uh, the seed, we're about 26 pounds, okay? So in that, you need 26, 30 pounds of sulfur in total. And then you can start to do some rough math to say, okay, what's being supplied from the atmosphere? Less than five pounds. How much is being supplied from the soil? When is it being supplied? And then what are our other choices? As he talked about, give me some, give me some fertilizers to get to me there. And so that's what we're going to. So here's the back of the envelope. This is not gospel truth, hear that. But this gets you in the place of, ooh, maybe I do need it, okay? Because there's gonna be situations that I run a 3% organic matter soil, that that 3% is gonna supply maybe that 12 pounds of sulfur, and I get another five pounds or so from the atmosphere, but I wanna run 75 bushel beans, I'm still nine pounds short, okay? So that kinda of gets you close. There's gonna be situations where, okay, that mass is gonna say, I should apply sulfur in every field. That is not true. Hear that loud and clear. This just gives you a chance to open your eyes that there's a potential that I do need this. There's not a good soil test that takes a, do I have a responsive site or not? You have to have reference strips out there. You have to have ammonium sulfite, pelletized gypsum, KTS, any of those as, as good potential options to look at this, okay? But I'm just getting you to think about where this could be responsive. All right, so here's just a, a quick drone picture of my sulfur playground, okay? So there's sulfur deficiencies, there's nitrogen deficiencies. All right, there's no doubt about that. You can see my little 10 foot by 50 foot plots. You can see um, this 80 acre field that uh, off to the, the, the west there, we didn't put any sulfur. The rest of the field just bulked for the farm. Guess what they put out, right? They put out the AMS, make sure they got enough sulfur. Okay, so this is the site that I, I go and I will explore every kind of option from the fertilizer sources, the rate response, uh, even some manure products. That is not what I want to talk about today. I want to go beyond that. I want to say, you got good ground, let's say. How can I use this information to push it? So let's push it. 
right? So if you're looking at sources, here's your, your quick answer, sir. Sol soluble sources of sul sulfur, close to planting. I used to be as close to planting as possible. I've kind of loosened that a little bit. Uh, if you're within a month and a half of planting, you should be good. Um, 15 to 20 pounds of sulfur is a good spot for us. To check that reference strip or if it becomes a common practice for you, uh, that's not bad. But most people are probably going to go upwards to 25 pounds of sulfur. I think about ammonium sulfate, right? 100 pounds of AMS is 24 pounds of sulfur. That's fine. You do not, you do not need to go any further higher than that. You do not need any more than that. Sources, ammonium sulfate is a good one. Pelletized chips is nice. Um, Mes-10, so you think about Mes-10, that's half, half elemental sulfur, half ammonium sulfate. Okay, so elemental sulfur, how long does it take to become available with elemental sulfur? That growing season or the next one? Thank you, the next one. It's three to 400 days for that to oxidize to become available. <laughs> Now, I just started to get into fall applications with some elemental. I said, okay, can we have this kind of cascading effect and have elemental in with my fall application? I don't have the answer yet on that one, but that's kind of the direction we're going. Okay. If you want to just kind of wait and see and not do anything, take leaf samples. Okay, take multiple leaf samples. Early reproductive stages, middle, when you're about to go out to fungicide sprays, and look if you're getting close to critical levels for sulfur. Okay, critical level is 0.25% sulfur. If you're close to that number, basically high 0.2s, that's probably a responsive site for us. Also, look at the ratio of nitrogen and sulfur in the tissue. Okay, this is telling you if you have an imbalance. All right, and so if you have more nitrogen than sulfur, or the other way to put it, you have less sulfur than nitrogen, okay, you're not using that nitrogen efficiently. efficiently. You're in an imbalance. All right, so if you're an 18 to 1 or higher, Traditionally, what was talk to, told me was a 20 to 1. What I've been seeing on soybeans the last five, seven years, if we're at 18 to 1 or higher, this is going to be a case where we're probably have a responsive site to sulfur. Okay, so if you're just going to take leaf samples, that's a good way to look at it. Be mindful. Again, each one of these slides is pretty much an hour talking, don't write. Uh, nutrient interactions. A lot of people are like, Sean, I want to put it out there when I'm doing some of my other fertilizer. I'll put it out with potash. All right, be very careful with this one. All right, double lot 60 is what I'm talking about. If you're putting it out, sulfur, whatever source it is, with double lot 60, calcium or potassium chloride, watch out for the chloride. Okay, if you're going to do this application close to planting, one out of three times, I get a three to five bushel yield hit. Hit that three to five bushel yield hit when I'm doing it close to planting. Chloride is affecting the roots, root hairs. You're affecting root hairs, you're affecting nodulation because that's what the bacteria infect and become the nodule. Okay, so if you do the potassium mix and blend, make sure you're a good couple months ahead of time if you're going to do that. I think the more promising if you want to do blending is with the phosphorus source. I really think in the data I've, I've got as extra slides at the end of this, um, that map, triple superphosphate, that is a much better place to blend than potassium. Okay, even though I know how many of you saw potassium deficiencies this June. It was dry, all right? That's what, what happened there. Build up your potassium ahead of the corn is my primary recommendation there. All right, I am transitioning finally to some of the high yield management. You gotta have both sulfur and nitrogen for high yielding beans. All right, so let's look at planting date and these interactions, okay? So um, you don't care about how I did it, you just trust that I did my work right, okay? This is a prairie soil is what I've gone to. This is our West Lafayette location. Okay, good organic matter, right? So you talk about it's uh, what are we, 3.84% organic matter, high CEC, so good, good prairie dirt. Drummer Flanagan types, right? That should bring you bell, Chalmers, all that. All right, so really good. Um, we did a whole plot planting date and then this fertility interaction. All right, so, all right, so here's the thing. You guys are gonna criticize me and say, Sean, that is not early planting. Please criticize me, and I wanna hear that because my early plantings in here are May 11th, May 12th, May 14th, May 12th, 2019. Who wants to forget that year? I mean, that was wet for everyone, right? We late planted, that's just the way it happened. And then compared to the first week of June, essentially, is what we're looking at. All right, so to plant early, what do you need? Good drainage. So there will be a donation box if you want to send some money over to Indiana for my fields that have better drainage, okay? So I can't plant early enough because these fields just don't have as good a drainage as they should. Now, we got lucky this year. We switched to VT and we're able to go a little bit earlier with even some Aprils. But understand, that's still early enough to catch this trend, right? So, 
worry about around me anymore. I want to kind of cut that off, all right? All right, so we got untreated control, ammonium sulfate to get some of his fertilizer questions. 20 pounds of sulfur, that's just a good spot for me. That's to say, do we have a response or not, okay? That's where I use it. You're gonna get about 17 and a half pounds of nitrogen. Uh, ammonium thiosulfate, so that's gonna be the liquid version. We're gonna broadcast across the ground, add about seven gallons of water, get it up to 15 gallons per acre before the beans are up, okay? That is not with any herbicide, hear that? It's just a nutrient solution alone. Uh, pelletized gypsum we brought in, so calcium sulfate, uh, 20 pounds of sulfur, and then uh, some people were saying, Sean, it's got to be the fertilizer nitrogen. It's the nitrogen. I said, all right, fine, I'll, I'll bring in uh, a component that has sulfur and nitrogen and nitrogen alone, okay? So within this, the nitrogen sulfur, a uh, number of years, we did AMS or gypsum plus urea, so we had 40 units of nitrogen in total, and then urea by itself with 40 units, okay? Makes sense before I go into data. All right, so 2018 was our first year doing this on prairie soil. Again, hear that. So we had planting date, uh, early planting date up on the top, late planting date in the bottom. We still have the fertility regimes here on tree to control, 62 bushel beans. And we're getting in seven to nine bushel, okay, seven to nine bushel with AMS, uh, ATS. The nitrogen and sulfur was upwards of maybe a 12 bushel response. So on a soil that you would think, a prairie soil, you should not see any sulfur response, right? Should not. Late planting, uh, 5th of June, 5960, 61. No differences, okay? Same exact soil right next door, no differences with that fertility tree, okay? So start thinking, I'm gonna go through about five years of data, but I want you to start thinking of why we see it on one set, but not the other, okay? May 12th, planting seven, nine bushel upwards to 12 bushel. 2020, Read that number, 62 bushel beans go to 80 bushel beans. 18 bushels, insane numbers to see this, okay? I looked at this about 500 different ways to say what data did we screw up to get an 18 bushel response in soybeans. We did it, okay? But that same set of fertility treatments on a late planting, 60 some bushel beans, not a bit of difference, okay? You look at ATS, that's pretty good. I brought in pelletized gypsum in that year, 75. Not bad, nitrogen and sulfur, 83. Okay, so very, very responsive. Uh, and then I start to bring in urea by itself, uh, 2021. We're at an order of a five to seven bushel response. Again, first weeks of June, nothing going on here. 2022, just to kind of get to the end story here, right? We're eight to 11 bushel response with the timely planted bean on a prairie soil that by all rights should not see a response, okay? With the late planting, there was no fertility effect, okay? So why? Why are we having this effect on the same soil? Mineralization, because of what? It was cooler with earlier planting, right? So we have limited mineralization, limited supply of sulfur, probably in a little bit of nitrogen from the organic matter of that soil because it was cooler, versus the first week of June, Soils are much warmer, microbial activity is churning, right? We have no issues there, okay? And it is. Here's, uh, I just got our weather station data. It's at a four inch depth, but you can kind of catch the week before, so each one of these years, 2018 to 2022, the week before planting, at four inch depth, we we're upper 50s, uh, uh, mid to upper 40s, right? Soil temperature is still in that upper 50s, and then we start to warm up. Versus the late planting, we're already facing 70 degrees or better at four inch depth. Okay, so again, backing up this thought process of, okay, we have cooler soils, we're having limited mineralization, and so then we need the sulfur, so then we can have good hydration. Yes, sir? This is conventional till ground, so this is chisel plow, and then uh, work twice and uh, once or twice in the spring. No, on top of the ground. I actually prefer on top of the ground. So the question was about tillage and the fertility application. So uh, all these years that you have right here, are all the conventional till, fertility was applied right after planting and rainfall works in. That's the only way we do it. It's all about, I think, location, location, location. I want that sulfur available for every root of that soybean. So I'd rather have the water work it in with a soluble source. Uh, and then Stephanie already put this picture up, I'll bring it back up. Now this year, 2023, 
All right, so we're seeing the response again. I was actually able to plant in April, finally, thank you. April 18th was this comparison. So, picture is taken end of August, all right? I'm treated control. This is on my prairie soil, guys. Okay, R3, so you take a leaf sample. Are you close to critical levels, R3? What first stage is that, by the way? First, ah, thank you. All right, we'll come back to the row stage talk next week, okay? Supposed to be a joke, thank you. All right. <coughs> <laughs> all right, we're done here. So our leaf, R3, all right, 0 0.2, uh, 0.26. So we're close to critical level. We're not truly actually deficient by strictest definition. You're close to it. So again, that's why I say if you're in this all right, upper 0.25 to upper 0.27, those are going to be responsive. Um, the nitrogen and sulfur ratio, we were 19 to 1. We were in balance. Mercer's right next door. I mean, literally, put away. These are typical wide blocks. All right, R3, we would already applied the sulfur up front at planting, 0.3%, okay? Nitrogen and sulfur ratio, 17 to one, okay? So you should see a very striking difference. What do you think the yield difference? Is there a yield difference between these two? Yeah, all right, so how many think, after all, whatever I share with four or five years of data, how many think it's at least eight bushel difference? Yeah, how many think 10 bushel? 15 bushels, 20, 22 bushels, guys. Here's what I'm looking at right here, the beginning slide. So we run from 77 bushel beans on that untreated control April 18th. AMS, 99 bushel. HS was not included because we were having planter trouble, so we were barely able to get planted before rains came in, and I wasn't able to get sprayed, so just understand that's why the HS is not on that one. Um, but we were able to get AMS spread, pelletized gypsum, 99 bushel, uh, pelletized gypsum plus urea, 101 bushel beans, okay? So you might catch a few ticks of a bushel or two with the nitrogen. It is a sulfur effect affecting nodulation. Now, if you want to have fun and just go for the highest yield, not worry about profit or anything else, yeah, you might want to throw some nitrogen out there, but that's really not what's causing this. It, go back to the gypsum, you go back to the AMS, those are the ones that are playing. Because look at urea by itself. 40 units of nitrogen, 80 bushel beans, by all rights, are not different than untreated control. Okay? And then you go to the May 12th, which was kind of my normal, <laughs> timely planted, right, over the last four or five years. We are still running from 75 bushel beans to 90s. Okay? So size will, size will yield difference when you think about that. 15 bushel responses. Okay? Um, I'll make the comment ATS, uh, about a 10 bushel. That one's kind of been a hit or miss for me, whether it's going to be the top tier sulfur source. Uh, it's not a bad one, but it's not always the top for me. So usually if you want to look at this, you want to play this game, or at least experience if you've got fields that are responsive, because not every field is. Uh, ammonium sulfate pelletized chips are probably the two best sources to start with. Uh, if you want to run Mesden, that's fine. If you want to get out some phosphorus, again, you don't want a price point, that, that, that's your decision. But those are the ones I start with. HS is still not a bad one, okay? Yes, sir. Okay. The question was how late can I apply sulfur and get the response? So this response is sulfur is affecting what in particular, guys? I'll use a crowdsourcing answer here, okay? Nodulation. When do you have nodulation? As soon as you have root hairs or bacteria infecting them. So the earlier you can apply it, the better, okay? You can still get a response if the field is a responsive site. So here are those caveats. V2, V3, V4, you're not going to get the same size of a response. Okay, so because you're losing out on some of the early nodulation benefits, you'll probably still get a little bit if it is a site or a condition that responds to it. But by, by and large, I want this applied uh, planting or before. But you can get away if you said, I want to plant timely, that should be your, your primary. Secondaries, and I get sulfur out by V2, I'll be fine. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so the question was, where is this coming from? So uh, what you're gaining here, you've got all that leaf retention. You remember seeing that picture? And so you've got more pods and you have bigger seed. So then it's the combination that we're holding on to a few more pods and we're making those seeds bigger. So yes, the combination. And oh, by the way, if you have uh, any quality or protein uh, benefit, we're usually about one to two, sometimes 3% protein increases on the absolute. Okay, you had a question. All right, so potassium sulfate, I have looked at potassium sulfate, not in the upfront, but I have looked at potassium uh, KTS in a starter with ATS. 
and they do both of those do well. Cake test and egg test and the starter of two inch band off to the side, um, up to 10 pounds of sulfur, you don't need to go any higher. It is still not as good as a granular spread of AMS or peltide chips. What about broadcast adapter and pulp paper? Uh, uh, KMAG has been second tier for me. So I haven't done anything on the prairie soil, on my sulfur playground, I looked at uh, KMAG, it has been a second tier responder. So it still has an improvement in terms of our yield response, but it's not to the same level as uh, ammonium sulfate or peltide chips. What about a straight KPS or four? Uh, I've not looked at that one yet, so I can't answer that one. Okay. So thank you for keep on probing to get all those squares. No, no, no. Because we need potassium too, right? Yep. You're getting two things you need here. Yep, yeah, you know, I, I think that's not a bad play, especially whenever I've already made the comment that if we're using KCL blended, we're going to get the chloride issue. Right. So potassium sulfate by itself could be. I have not looked at it in that way. Um, from the YouTube chat, what is the NNS product that you're referring to? So the NNS product, uh, so in this particular set, this is where we brought in peltized gypsum for the sulfur source, okay? And then the nitrogen source is going to be urea on this one. Uh, my early years, I did a combination of ammonium sulfate and then bring it up to the, so you have 17 and a half pounds of nitrogen, then add in the gypsum or add in the urea to get up to 40 units. But uh, usually it's going to be a soluble source like gypsum plus urea. Okay. Good. Other questions? Again, this could be hours almost. All right, so I'll summarize this. This is fertility interaction, planting date, about this cooler soils, mineralization side of it. Anything that's affecting sulfur availability is what I'm driving at. I use planting data as this idea, but what are some other situations that are going to limit a sulfur availability from your soil? Planting earlier, cooler soils. What are other conditions? I hinted at them earlier. Wet, good. What else? Was that what your comment was, Chris? Yeah. Go back to your carbon sources. Okay. Anything you're doing no till versus this, right? So that anything that's going to tie up that sulfur, right? Uh, fertility did not affect sulfur. Fertility did not affect the late plantings. So again, the conditions are key that are affecting the mineralization of that organic matter, as well as nodulation and fixation. Okay. Um, and I always do this. I have way more slides than I have time for. Other questions? Because I can keep on going for a while. I got ten ish minutes, I think. Okay. I'll get into some more fun inter interactions. Um, Please say, I uh, hope I didn't say funner. Did I say funner? Did I say funner? Okay, that's the North Carolina State Education, sorry. <laughs> no. All right, so within this, I get excited, guys. You know, call me out on it. It's actually Stephanie's influence. She is not in the Comas area. All right, so 20 pounds of sulfur, yes, no. And then we brought in some foliar protection, okay? These interactions, these are done prophylactically. Uh, so we got fungicide by itself, insecticide by itself, and combination. We did uh, Freaxor in 19 and 20, Revitec in 21 and 22. Um, I actually uh, do applications R4, early R4. A lot of the industry does more R3. I think there's more benefit personally out of R4 applications early. Um, some of our work in terms of pod development and seed fill is a lot more going later, so I want to protect that. And so that's where I've, uh, I've gone with my uh, applications and recommendations. So here's some interesting interactions. So in this prophylactic way, so just follow me here. You got no sulfur column. You have the fungicide, the insecticide, or the combination. So with nothing done, 67 bushel beans all the way down the line. No differences. When we add sulfur as a base, okay, you might say I gained a couple bushels in the 2019 year, but not a whole lot. But what's interesting is when you add sulfur as a base plus the insecticide applications, now we're looking on the order of a seven bushel response. Okay. So think about that. Again, the sulfur that is affecting nodulation is affecting leaf retention. Now you're doing something to protect what? The leaves. <coughs> and again, I go to the pods themselves. Okay, then we're protecting those pods. So then instead of losing a couple pods, we're retaining those and we've got the benefit of the extra nitrogen supply. So then we can start to really get the photosynthase going over there. So that's the, the, the streamlined process of this. So that's 2019. 2020, just to show that I don't always get yield results that are positive or any results, right? So just to hold me true, there's nothing going on in 2020, but understand why. Okay, this is on prairie soil. So no results, no differences with any of the fungicide, insecticide, with sulfur or without, but it was planted late. 
So again, hope you learned a lesson on the plenty date interaction. When we planted it late, we didn't get the benefit out of it. Okay? So I think there is a lesson there. So now let's go to 21. We go and we gain upwards of eight bushel with the sulfur application from nothing to pre AMS. We actually did V4s. I answer your question, sir. And then you look at these uh, fungicide and insecticide by themselves, nothing going on. But boy, when you have that as a base with the sulfur plus the fungicide and insecticide, we're gaining another four to six bushel. Okay? So it's becoming now it's a system. You're planting timely. All right, do I have fields that are responsive to the sulfur? So you got to test for that. And then if they are, there's some interesting synergies out there whenever you look at an R4 type application with the fungicide and insecticide. I dare say it's actually more of the insecticide than the fungicide. Okay? These are all prophylactic applications. We did not have a disease at the threshold. We did not have insects at the threshold. I'll get a little soapbox on insect complexes. We did have bean leaf fields. We did have green steep bugs. Individually, they were not at complex or at threshold. I think we should really think about the bean leaf beetle, green steam bug, uh, Japanese beetle in combination threshold, then to have that application. But I'm not going to do that work. I'm not going to count all the insects. But that's the concept I think that's going on here is that we have some of these insects that are really starting to feed, either pierce or scar, or even drop the pods and get this full benefit with the sulfur and the insecticide. Okay? Uh, I'll beat the dead horse that happened again in 22. Okay, so this this combination effect of nothing going on individually. Look at this guy, fungicide, insecticide. He may sell it. Nothing going on, right? Prophylactic. But when we had sulfur as a base, we gained five bushels, and we gained another five or six bushels with that prophylactic application. Again, here all those kind of caveats. But that is a system that's been pretty interesting. Um, biological. So I kind of tried to wrap up here. I switched gears in 23 because biologicals are hot and heavy, right? And so is there any interactions going on there? So we brought in some of the nitrogen suppliers. So in Viva and Nutrition in particular, our kind of typical no, no sulfur, add sulfur, and then that Revitec fast act uh, combination. Okay. What do we get? No, no interaction, no nitrogen supplier effect from the biological. Uh, our four foliar protection didn't do anything for us. The gypsum, we gained eight bushel or so with that sulfur source. And when we added that up with the foliar protection, you didn't get a difference because you see those little A's and little B's, but it did kind of have that nice little stair step once again, okay? Kind of go in that direction. So, um, oh, I forgot about gum crop study. Um, <laughs> any questions? I got a lot going on. I do want to at least hit a couple of these and because um, they're not going to yank me out. I'm bigger than Stephanie, so I'm going to keep going. Uh, so within the so cover, so cover crops, and this is actually one that I want to share because uh, we're, we partnered up. And so Indiana's got it, Illinois's got it, and so we've got cereal rye out there, so this kind of gives you a scenario. We planted it in October, right after that corn stalk, get them up and growing, and then now we've got 12, 14 inch tall and terminated, right? So I stumbled across this one in 2018 when we got some guys uh, starting to look at that. Uh, that sulfur, yes, no. And this was in Tipton County, 3.5% organic matter soil. So again, by all rights, should not respond to sulfur. But I went out there, I caught the whole field, the 70, 80 acre field, and you could catch every one of the strips. So we put out 100 pounds of AMS. So beans look tremendous, right? No, no sulfur. So we had differences in node number. So it affected how fast they were growing. The pod number, whenever the yield monitor came through, it was 11 bushel difference. Okay? The other part of this story is that this was a cereal rye ahead of the whole field. So then my brain starts to go, okay, cereal rye got that carbon influence. Do we have some immobilization occurring? So finally, get some funding from Indiana and Illinois to do this work. So last year was the first year we did this. So yes, no cereal rye. We brought in my classic. Here's my 20 pounds of sulfur. Here's my 40 units of nitrogen. And then the combination of the two, okay? Uh, terminate about 12, 16 inches tall, uh, nothing crazy. Because here's my belief, I want soybeans planted timely so I get the best yield potential. Maybe I can gain a little bit of organic matter. I know I'm not building the same organic matter when I go with my chest on that cereal rye, but I want the beans planted timely. I want to get that benefit. So that's my mentality with this. Uh, Indiana, we got two lo three locations we end up doing. Illinois, up in Urbana with Geo when he came over. All right, so here's what the Indiana site looked like. This is West Lafayette again, prairie soil, guys. So we terminated April 18th. 
So the only thing we did on this field, we did a VT pass in the fall because I didn't like all the residue. That's the only tillage that was done on this field. So then we drilled it, all right, terminated. We applied uh, sulfur sources, urea, everything else, May 5th and 6th, and we planted that day. We got rain that night, so perfect conditions. We got everything that worked right. We got a half inch rain that night, and here's what it started looking like all summer long. So you've got, what you guessed in here, nitrogen and sulfur deficiencies showing up in which plot? DRI, as well as no-till. So here's what it looks like aerially. So let me put the through here for you. So I'll go to the center so that I'm, I'm concentrating here. So we've got, let's go zero rye. Uh, zero rye right here, right? No fertility added. So highlighter green, they were nitrogen and sulfur deficient. When we added in the gypsum, so sulfur source, we brought it back, okay? When you look at zero rye with just urea, just nitrogen, that didn't do it. Again, so the idea of what's really going on here, that zero rye is immobilizing the sulfur that's affecting our nodulation. So we were able to overcome it. What's interesting also with this is the no cover, no fertility. Again, we were dry, so we kind of exacerbated, the season exacerbated this. So we actually had some nitrogen sulfur deficiencies. We're gonna show you multiple ways with that. Um, some nitrogen sulfur deficiencies there. Then you bring in no cover with chips and nice dark green. So what did it mean at the end of the day? End of the day, we were running 61 bushel beans, uh, no cover, no fertility. The CRI, no fertility, we got about a six or seven bushel yield hit. Okay, six or seven yield, uh, six or seven bushel yield hit. All right, we add your name, you might think about getting a few, but here's the fun part of this, right? The no cover, gypsum, 71 bushel beans. The CRI, gypsum, 71 bushel beans. We brought them back to life to the same yield level. And then if you really want to kind of put some more to it, we put the urea and the gypsum, 74 bushel beans, CRI, urea, gypsum, 74 bushel beans. So we brought them back to life, okay? So again, not the, I mean, there's systems you got to work through. So CRI is a system you've got to work through. And I think that we can really push it, but if you're just putting the CRI and saying all the beans can handle it, you better be thinking that one over again. Okay, but you can, you can manage your way out of that. 71 bushel beans, that's, let's look at that. Right? 15, 16 bushel response. You're looking at a 20 bushel response, 54 bushel beans to 74. And that trial is 30 foot by 700 foot plots. It's field scale, okay? It's not my small plot stuff either. So if you're saying, oh, that's just a small plot crap. No, it's field scale, you'll know how to do. Okay. Here's the final thing. Timely planting is foundational for us. I think there's opportunities for nitrogen and sulfur. Field conditions that affect sulfur availability, so whether that's uh, earlier planting, cover crops, uh, no-till conditions, let's look at those as opportunities to really push it. And then look at some potential synergies whenever we have a sulfur as a base and some of those foliar protection that comes later, maybe a little bit more so on the insecticide, uh, pod retention and pod fill. So with that, Happy answering any questions. I want to thank Indiana. I want to thank Illinois, the United Soybean Board for their work that they've supported. Follow me on the Purdue Soybeans uh, podcast. A lot of fun. We do that every couple weeks, so you can find us anywhere there. And I think they added a slide. Oh, not that one. Oh, here we go. That one. So, questions? Wow. I hit you with a lot, <laughs> don't I? I, I? I want you to really earn your keep here with you know, what data you're getting, right? What are recommendations? Yeah. I've been applying the APS with the herbicide. Yep. Uh, incorporating the free gallon. Am I taking am I losing that much by doing that? Would it gain that much to go post um, as far as with you know, post sulfur? Mm. When I think post I mean post plant. Yeah, I understand. So the question was, he's uh, mixing ATS with this herbicide and incorporating that, and so he's wondering if there's some loss there. Uh, instead of uh, incorporating that, you should put it over to the top. Um, ATS is just been a, a finicky thing for me. And so I, I'd say you might actually be better in some cases incorporating it. I just haven't looked at a, a broadcast spray the ATS and the broadcast and incorporated because I think we get kind of the ATS sometimes in the broadcast spray is getting tied up on the corn stalks and we don't have enough rain to work it in. And then usually you think about the, um, the thiosol part of that, it takes two to three weeks for that to oxidize to become available. So 
I dare say in your situation without any data to back it, I say stay with what you're doing. Okay, because I think that uh, that incorporation with ATS in particular, and in my so-so responses to ATS, I think it's actually put in a better place to have soil moisture, to have it available, to have oxidation occur for that particular fertilizer. Sean, I wonder if uh, you had uh, five years or more of cover crops, if it would be any different results. If we had five years or more of cover crop, so basically you're saying if we're getting into maybe a, a shift in biology and microbial activity, uh, would there be a change? I mean, I could say yes, sure. I think there's got to be some level of microbial change. I don't know whether those are going to bring in, um, think about those that are going to mineralize sulfur in a way that's going to become available. I, I just don't know that one. Um, I would sure hope that, again, I believe in the system in terms of building organic matter, have more organic matter soil that's got to have some good uh, water holding capacity, fertility, you know, retention, all those kind of things. Now, whether we're still going to see a sulfur immobilization out of that, I dare say I think we still will. And uh, another question on strip fill, what are you doing in terms of evaluation, evaluating the same kind of a program uh, versus conventional on strip fill, where you can put more fertilizer in the Okay, so the question was uh, looking at strip till versus conventional till or no till and that fertility application. Um, strip till is nice because then you can do, kind of do that one pass, right? And if I'm reading your question correctly, the idea of putting the, the fertility in the band below, I think that's a nice idea. I really question the sulfur side of it because of location. And what I mean by that, we've we started to do this in the greenhouse, but not enough work on it to basically say, if I've got that one root attached to a sulfur supply, is that enough for that whole root system? Versus, do I need the sulfur in all of the distribution of the roots so then I can have the cofactor for nodulation? Based on my starter work, so I've done two inch offsets, uh, single and dual, HS, KTS, KFUs, versus some granular, the granular is still winning out. So my gut without having that strip till recommendation uh, study is that we still need the sulfur and over the top type application. Um, you think about some of like, you go back to corn, corn has access to a pan, you're good to go, but I, I, I go back to we're affecting nodulation and the bacteria, we've got to have the sulfur distributed. That's, that's why I'm at. Yeah. Um, from YouTube, someone says, um, I've heard that U of I's fertilizer rec had phosphorus higher and potassium lower and heard Purdue always had potassium higher and phosphorus lower. Can you talk to that? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going with the U of I Purdue uh, debate. Sounds good. Let's meet at the beef house. Okay. <laughs> so within that, so the, I haven't looked at, I'll, I'll answer the question later, so I'll do it, but I'll repeat it for everyone. Basically that we had a lower phosphorus number and a higher potassium number versus U of I had the opposite. And so I'd have to go back, I don't remember that being the case, um, but here's, here's my answer on just both, both of those nutrients for the crop itself. Again, you need them both, no doubt about that. Manage the potassium, this goes against what a lot of agronomists say, manage the potassium Manage the potassium for the corn crop. We've got CDC soil, and then make sure it's there for the soybeans because the phosphorus benefit for the soybeans, I, I didn't show it in today's talk. I continue to get a few two to four bushel increases with that plus the sulfur, even on soils that are adequate on the phosphorus. So that's my answer on that. Um, but also here, here that uh, phosphorus sources, all right, you're getting some free sulfur. Okay, did you know that? Triple superphosphate, that, that, you're getting one to two percent sulfur, okay? It's not standardized, so they don't tell you that, but if you think about it, you're putting out 100 units, you're gonna get two to three pounds of sulfur, all right, so that's good. Some of you might say, well, Sean, I wanna use the nitrogen for the corn, okay? And I'm putting, when are you putting your math and DAP out? Fall? Is your corn really getting that? Okay, so stop complaining about the nitrogen, all right? All right, question. First off, congratulations on planning in April. <laughs> it only took how many years, thanks. So we, we keep pushing this planning date further and further back up. Yeah. Um, there's a big difference between planning date and emergence yeah. date. I agree. Um, you, you know, in the early planning situations where it's sitting for two and a half, maybe three weeks, in an ATS scenario where we've got that in advance, is that buying some time to actually get it available 
mm -hmm. uh, in those er ultra or earlier situations. So I'll repeat it, Chris, to make sure I'm catching it. So push and plane earlier and earlier, and the means are going to be sitting on the ground two, three weeks. And so now with the ATS, because I like the ATS because it's easier. You just throw the sprayer, run, you're done, right? And then has that time. All right. So he's, you're, Chris, you're talking about the time, which is great. But what do we need for that ATS to become available? Okay. So you need the rain. That's one. What's the second part we need? warmer soil the microbial activity so i hear you loud and clear and i agree that in theory that should gain us more time for the ats benefits for water to move it in great but we still need the heat we still need the temperature for microbial activity for that oxidation so i'd say i'm halfway there with you yep other questions yes sir So I'm currently putting on about 15 to 20 pounds of uh, sulfur elemental in the fall. Elemental, okay. And that's for corn and beans. So every year? Every year. Okay. So would I be better off putting like gypsum down after planting? I'm planting last couple weeks in April, mm -hmm. last three or four years. So averaging about 80, mm -hmm. would changing that up make a difference? How many years have you been doing the elemental application? Uh, four or five years. Okay, so you're you're ahead of the, the research curve. I've had the question for years, I haven't done it. So his comment was that he's been elemental out in the fall, three or four years in a row, 15 to 20 pounds of sulfur for both crops. And so the idea is that your three to 400 days for that fall application will be available for the second growing season, not that up and coming one, or at least not enough. But you do that enough that you've got this kind of cascading effect. Um, I dare say you're probably doing okay. Uh, you may even be perfect. I just personally just, just started this exact study this fall where I put out six different sulfur sources with elemental, ahead of corn, ahead of soybeans and to follow this rotation effect. So I say where you're at right now, you're probably just fine. The only way that I would change that up is go ahead and do with corn, soybeans, it doesn't matter. Do just one quick reference trip and you'll know in a hurry if that's you, you need it more or not. But I mean, if you can just go to Menards and get the pelletized chips and I don't care and just spread it out and just see if you're getting them more of a benefit or not. But I dare say you're probably already to the level that you're, you're fine. I, I doubt that you need a soluble source. Yeah, yeah. So with all those situations, the late April planting, 15, 20 pounds of sulfur elemental every year. Um, when we put out elemental, I didn't do it on the prairie soil, my uh, sulfur playground, we put out elemental at planting, and we do, you do oxidize. It's not like it takes three to 400 days and then it's available. You do oxidize some. And so we would get three to four bushels during that current growing season from an elemental versus an AMS was giving us 12 to 14. So you are getting some, even with that planting application on a sulfur deficient field. So now your scenario into the fall. Okay, let's also think about this. Time is not equal with the elemental sulfur. The fall application just makes it easy for you. When is it becoming available? You've got to have what again? Moisture and heat for the microbial activity to break it down. So that's still breaking down during your growing season. Okay. What about zinc? We need it. Uh, in terms of uh, doing an additional application to zinc and soybeans versus, I think, about some of the world in corn, I have not seen the benefit like a lot of people see in the corn world. So, good question. Other questions? I'll be around for lunch if you guys have any more. Thank you. Yep. So thank you so much, Sean. Uh, this concludes our presentations today. I'd like to thank all the presenters um, this morning for all, and also want to thank you for attending today. Thank you so much. Um, our next Better Bean stop is Thursday, January 18th, next week at Rin Lake College. We're going south, going to Southern Illinois. And then that will be followed by 
Uh, our final Bitter Beans event on the 25th in Deer Grove, where we go to Northern Illinois. We will conclude our winter meeting series with the Soybean Summit on February 1st. And as always, registration is open on lsoyadvisor.com for these events and will be broadcasted on YouTube as well and be recorded and later on provided on lsoyadvisor.com. Um, we would like you to please take a moment to fill out the event out evaluation. We really do look at those. Um, we get a lot of great suggestions on things that you would like to hear about. Um, and so please fill those out. Your participation is very valued and your feedback helps us enhance these events each year. Um, and last but not least, Connie has asked me to have you leave your lanyards she, Connie, raise your hand. Where do you want them to leave them at? On the table? On the tables. All right. Thank you so much, and let's go eat. Make oh! Sure, make sure you grab a black bag after you eat on your way out. We appreciate you guys. Sorry. I have more. I missed a page. Sorry. You can't eat yet. <laughs> um, as always, we encourage you to go to elsewayadvisor.com. And we also want you to make sure um, that you follow us on Twitter and Facebook as well, Elsewhere Advisor. Um, with that, we will conclude, and I am supposed to tell you, or I'm gonna get in trouble by Connie, that every one of you is supposed to pick up a water holding bucket. It's black, full of goodies for you. And so please take it home. Thank you. Thank you.